Is this the camera? Who knows? But regardless, <laughs> so excited to welcome you to uh, Chrome Contributor Days. Um, Browser Contributor Days, it's true. I tried to loop Addy into Chrome Contributor Days, so I'm always calling it Chrome Contributor Days, but Addy's all about the inclusion of the web, so we changed it to Browser Contributor Days. Um, so we have a lot of really amazing folks who are joining us today. Thank you so much all for being here and for being online too. We have a few amazing folks online. Uh, myself, Addy, and uh, Jay Phelps, who is going to be moderating the online chat and uh, helping the folks uh, online will be sort of leading the event. Um, just an idea about Contributor Days. So uh, we do Contributor Days through for a few different frameworks and different libraries. We've done it for RxJS, we've done it for Angular a few times, um, and we've done it for Vue as well, and super excited to do browser. So the whole idea about Contributor Days is to promote this inclusion of the web and the exciting things that are happening, um, you know, in the front end. and. Yeah, there's just so much happening in the web these days. I mean, it's so it goes so fast. <laughs> so, I mean that in a good way. yes, we're just trying to keep up with all the amazing things uh, that things are enabled. Um, I wanted to go ahead and thank our sponsors really quickly. So, Google, thank you, Addy, for getting everything set up You're and welcome. sponsoring food. Uh, and spent the weekend, you know, carpeting this room, everything. <laughs> <laughs> And then also uh, my company, The Thought Labs, and my co-founders who allow me to do all the things open source um, and just let me run wild with all the crazy ideas I have of, uh, you know, doing things for the community. Um, our schedule today, so this is our welcome. We'll be doing a few uh, introductions as well. Then we'll be going through different browser updates. And then we'll get into discussions. So I see a lot of you guys have already posted comments in the chat, feel free to keep doing that. Um, you can also hashtag contributor days and ask anybody. Most of the folks are online. You can find everybody's Twitter handle on the website if you like. Um, and then we'll do ending remarks. So just an idea of who is in the room. Uh, we have uh, myself from, and Jay from this dot. Jay's really into WebAssembly, so you can ask him all those questions there. We have Addy and Alex from and uh, Shubi from the Chrome team. And then we have Patrick and Stephanie from the Edge team. Thanks for being here. Uh, and then we also have Harold and David from the Firefox slash Mozilla team. Thank you for being here as well. Um, we have Jonathan as well, representing Brave. Thank you for being here. And then we have, let's see, Dominic, who has uh, been a great contributor to, to a lot of different standards and uh, browsers. Uh, we have uh, Martin who's worked on uh, web platform stuff at Agalia. He'll be talking about some of the things he's done there. Um, Kenneth who uh, I think he chairs W3C um, who is online. Thanks Kenneth for joining. Your meal looked really delicious uh, on Twitter. Um, and then we have Ben here also representing uh, Angular and RxJS. And did I miss anybody or I think that is it. Yeah. So do you want to lead into yeah. a little bit yeah, about? Mm -hmm. Sure. So we're going to kick off presentations from folks um, in just a second. Um, I want us to talk real quick about uh, why I love the web. So the web is this kind of amazing content discovery platform. It's one of the, the largest open computing platforms the world has ever seen. And it's kind of amazing because it's, it's free, it's open, it allows anybody to make their mark. And it's one of those unique platforms because uh, not only can you render a tweet in a browser like Firefox, but you can do so in Windows 2000, cross-compiled using WebAssembly, displaying it in Chrome on an Android device <laughs> for no good reason whatsoever. Um, one of the great things about WebAssembly is that you know uh, we've increasingly seen support sort of cross-browser, and one of the reasons why we wanted to do a Browser Contributor Days event is that we do share this love for the open web and for seeing standards evolve and capabilities evolve. So um, we're pumped to chat with everybody today. Um, leading us off with our first sort of state of updates from the browser is going to be Edge. So um, welcome to the stage. Uh, some Edge reps, and we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, my name is Patrick. This is Stephanie. And I'm just going to give you guys a quick update uh, for a few minutes on what we've been working on recently in Edge and then what we're going to be looking at in the next uh, coming months. So yeah, we work at Edge. 
Uh, so uh, the way that Edge releases is that we have roughly two releases a year every six months. The most recent one was the April 2018 release because uh, Edge is tied to uh, Windows updates which happened in April 2018. Uh, we added a whole bunch of new features. There's way too many to cover in the five minutes that we have here, but uh, a couple of my favorite. Um, oh, this is also known as Edge 17. That's what I would normally call it as opposed to the Spring Creators update. It's ridiculous name. Windows is ridiculous namings, but we call it Edge 17. That's the current stable release of Edge. Uh, one of the most exciting PWA support fully landed by default inside of Edge. We have support for service workers. Yeah, please applaud. Alex Russell is holding his applause, but yes. Um, rightfully so. Uh, we have full support for service workers by default, uh, some support for the manifest attributes, uh, all the underlying APIs fetch. We completely rewrote our networking stack over the course of many months in order to be completely based on fetch. All kinds of fun stuff. The team that worked on that has done a phenomenal amount of work. Uh, another one of my pet favorite features is variable fonts. Uh, variable fonts, in case you guys are unaware, is the ability to uh, adjust number of properties inside a font file. So you can make a font file you know, wider, taller, etc. So rather than shipping a bold and a non-bold or an italic version of a font. You can have all that in one font and adjust it with CSS. They're really, really cool. They're supported across all, nearly all latest browsers now. You should be really be looking into them if you're doing any kind of UI work on the web. They're fantastic. Um, there's, like I said, way more updates. You can go to the Edge uh, status update blog. If you just look that up, you'll find it. Uh, so uh, already almost halfway through with our time, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we're looking forward in our next release. There is, again, a whole bunch of uh, updates that have been put into that browser. We've been focusing on fundamentals, doing stuff like uh, you know, user requests. We've been working on developer tooling, all kinds of fun stuff. My, again, pet favorite feature is this thing called WebAuth. WebAuth has the ability to <clears throat> uh, log into your device using uh, two-factor authentication in your device. So things like, imagine you're uh, in Windows, we have this thing called Windows Hello, where you can look at your face on your laptop and it will detect that it is you and that is your face and it can unlock everything. Now you can log into your website with your face using WebAuth. It's really, really cool. And one of the most exciting things about this is that it's uh, just announced that Safari is going to be supporting this in the not too distant future. So you'll be able to use the same thing using your touchpad on your phone. Um, so nearly all websites are going to be able to, to support this in the near future, which means passwords can be going away. It's a very exciting way. Um, then again, we've been focusing on a lot of fundamentals. We've been putting a ton of effort inside of performance, inside of this is everything from developer performance and developer tooling to user performance, things like scrolling updates, rendering, making edges stable and as fast as possible. Uh, one of the things we've been putting the most effort in though is actually developer experience, making it so that we have a really rich developer tooling ecosystem. If anybody's ever had to use Edge to debug a problem, we know that it can be painful sometimes. Our dev tools were not up to snuff to the wonderful Chrome and Firefox teams but that's something we've been putting a lot of effort into and we've been really focusing on developers and a lot of the thing it's kind of a mantra at Microsoft if you're not familiar um, but one of the coolest things that uh, the team has been working on uh, for developer experiences is actually this product that we recently renamed to WebHint uh, you can check it out at webhint.io and Stephanie's going to tell you a bit about it yeah so WebHint is our linting tool for the web, you can uh, run an online scan at webhint.io and it'll tell you what's wrong with your website so you can go in and fix it. Um, we, yeah, so we just renamed it from Sonarwall to Webhint and um, our team just made some performance updates and user experience updates inside the command line tool. And then right now we're actually working on improving the online scan experience. So there's lots of good stuff happening. It's a note module as well. So yeah, it's a really, really cool product. You guys should check it out. You can install it in Node Module, have it on the, uh, your CI systems, all sorts of stuff. Like I said, there's way more updates than we could possibly fit into this, but unfortunately, we're nearly out of time. Uh, feel free to reach out to either myself or Stephanie on Twitter uh, or any of the other Edge team to find out more, and we'll hopefully we'll chat a bunch over the next two hours. Cheers. We're going to have Harold from Firefox giving us a round of updates, so take it away. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Uh, as I just said, Harold, I work on developer experience as a product manager, continue the theme of cool updates. So again, like what's what's shipping right now, uh, production ready and tools included, we have variable fonts. And Patrick already gave it away. Um, 
and because I'm at Google, I have to talk about the performance aspect of variable fonts, being able to snip out the multiple fonts you have in a page into one file and using the, 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 the access to make actually make it work well. We'll get more on it on Amnian. You can try it out there as well. Then see the shapes. It's also coming in 62 for us. That means it's in three browsers then. Uh, and with these tools, it's very important that you these are all progressive enhancements. You can add them to your page. You can make them more beautiful. You don't need to wait for every browser to get into them. So this is something you can add, sprinkle in. <laughs> like, and it doesn't have to be pixel perfect. So the web is flexible. So with all these, um, there's always this fear, I know I have to learn a new CSS property. So with, with DevTools, with developer experience, we're focusing a lot. How can these tools that still often look like Firebug a uh, few years ago, actually evolve better to serve front end designers and don't just fiddle around with CSS properties on a very low level, but abstract them to a level that you can actually work on a complex layout with tools that you expect from like a design workflow. So we start this process with giving you the three columns, this three pane mode within the inspector. So you actually can see your uh, CSS, CSS rules in the middle, and also see the layout aspects in the right side here with the grid inspector. And variable fonts, also shipping with a new inspection tool. So on the right, you see changing the axis, actually life changes the, the, the font preview within the page, allows you to just move around. Then shape path, again, you can click within the page, you can cl click on the shape, and you can edit the polygon live. So within, within the same of front development, of course, you need good accessibility tools. Uh, Pen is one of them that gives you like things you need to change in your page. So it's a great shout out, but you also need to dig into the insights of your page, like how is it represented to screen readers, and that's what the accessibility inspector gives you as a new panel. Exciting also to finally ship web components. So that, that makes three browsers. Let's start using it. <laughs> and more to follow probably. Uh, there's it's it unlocks a lot of stuff on the web. People have been waiting for it for a long time. There's already a lot of solutions that depend on it, that polyfill it, things should get faster uh, while more people ship it. And again, the story of shipping a new capability with tooling. So we, we went, um, we did what Chrome does, so you're gonna see your Shadow DOM, you can see like your uh, slots within the inspector, but you can also click through a Shadow DOM to see the custom element within Bugger, which because suddenly your layout and your DOM elements are linked to JavaScript code. So you should be able to get there. So what's in progress? Uh, what, what should you keep an eye out for and help, hopefully adopt early and get feedback on in, in the theme of the contributor days? So readable streams, uh, something I'm really excited about because it unlocks a lot of the performance capabilities within service workers and other places, getting data to the front end quicker and helping the browser to parse and render as early as possible because most of the team most of the things in the UI also streamed. Also coming along is WebRender. It will start shipping to users on Firefox now. And if you're not aware, WebRender moves a lot more things to the GPU, give you more space on the main thread, and give you not just faster rendering, but also more consistent rendering by removing all the performance cliffs of creating layers. It also allows you to change the thing, like how you think about performance, like layers basically non-existent anymore in, in here, so that is something to keep in mind. So, WebAssembly, uh, Mozilla has been uh, pushing that for the last two years. It's now in all browsers. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So, um, and now it's it's about getting it into people's hands. So, as in, in the last uh, months, we've been pu pushing a lot on uh, for Rust to WebAssembly. Uh, which, which unlocks a lot of people who really like Rust. It's a big language that comes up as a system language in the web community, but still not everybody's language. So the next step is getting actually, how do you get WASM modules into people's hands without letting them write Rust? And there's, of course, NPM as a package module. Uh, there's a, there are some more ways now that you can just cross-compile to WASM and get that into an NPM module, and you just include your SIP library, your image encoding library, whatever you need that needs native speed. And again, uh, with great power comes great tools. So we, uh, this is something not very prime time yet. This is a preview of Nightly. And you will see on the right side is actually the Rust call stack and you're debugging the Rust code within the JavaScript debugger in Firefox. So, um, and because we needed to improve source maps a lot for that, to map all right pieces to right code and get the original code for Rust back into a browser, we also applied this to other original languages. So if you use TypeScript or Babel with ES16, ES17, then this is something 
usually you saw your variables kind of burped out across the panel because like, they're just all cross-compiled and Webpack adds things and Babel adds things and stepping acts all weird. So you can see original code, but nothing acts uh, the way it does. And we, we went the whole mile, like now you actually within the debugger, you'll, you'll see TypeScript, you see the variables. We're doing a lot of magic around mapping variables from the original code. It's all Babel based in the browser. So it's, it's really the web coming together in one great way. So AV1, if you're into video, uh, that's something to check out. It's a new codec that will hopefully free the web from constrained codecs that people have to pay for and that, that you have to uh, encode in a um, constrained way. And it's open source and royalty free and Mozilla is working uh, on it with others and it's in nightly behind the pref if you want to try it out against your site. The last piece I have is Gecko View for Android. So we had Firefox for Android for a while and it's in great shape, uh, people who love it, but we also, Lotus with Quantum, there's a lot more do that we can do to free the engine better from uh, make it embeddable because there's no real uh, browser engine that you can just use on Chrome. There's web views, but they're mostly based for like, you can make a website within your app, but they're not made to build a browser. And that's what people usually use them for. So you get a lot of constraints. And Gecko View is a library for Android that uses the Gecko engine they actually build browsers with. So it comes first in uh, Gecko View in Firefox Clar and Firefox Focus, which is the uh, so it's the two versions of Firefox that we have uh, on Android, beyond Firefox on Android. <laughs> so it gets confusing. Um, and they're already on GitHub, and if you check out the repos, there's a way that you can get early access. And there we <laughs> All right, uh, next up we have Alex Russell from Chrome giving us a state of updates. Let's... Hi, good afternoon. I'm Alex Russell. I'm a software engineer on the web platform team in Chrome. And um, we've been busy, <laughs> I think is the short way to frame it. So there's a lot that we've been up to over the past call it four or five years, but the overall trajectory of our work has been to try to bring to you as a developer the power that was missing um, in order to go actually deliver the experiences that you wanted to deliver, because the web has been historically the world's most friction-free delivery experience, right? You don't have to think about downloading something before you can get to the content on the other side of a link. You just tap on the link and there you are. So yeah, it, it was a world... Uh, of difference to the way we just deliver software in the desktop era. And to compete on the desktop era, we needed things like Ajax and we needed things like better JavaScript performance in order to get to competitive experiences. In the mobile world, we have missed some of those similar fundamental capabilities. So we've been working hard to make sure that the APIs that you have access to, specifically for mobile users, are on par with what your native developer counterparts are getting access to. So we want to add the ability to reach users the same way, but safely, uh, in ways that ensure that you still have the good reputation that the web has earned over time with its paranoid security model uh, behind you. So we're trying to extend your reach, and the primary way we have attempted to do that has been through bundling up a series of user experience properties that we think are good for mobile users into a single package and then giving you credit for meeting that bar. We've called that progressive web apps, but building experiences that are fast, that are reliable, that work when you're offline or on a flaky network connection that have earned the metadata um, attribution that we would give you if you were installed, earning your place in the home screen, earning your place in the start menu. Those are things that we have worked hard to make sure uh, that we've got the technology to support, but also that we then back up with setting a high bar so that the content that users come back to is actually content that they want. Being able to be re-notified or engaged through the notification system is something that you should have to earn. Um, and so we've been working hard on both sides of that project. One, to give you the capabilities, and on the other hand, to make sure that we're all using them responsibly and that users are benefiting when you decide to, to, to use them. So um, I'm happy to say that as of uh, Edge, shipping, oh, sorry, 
Safari shipping service workers earlier this year, uh, we now have a, an almost full house for service worker support. I think it's only a few legacy use cases that don't have this today, which means that it's possible to build reliable experiences almost everywhere for your users. Uh, there are obviously caveats. This is a complex system. It took a long time to design, and there, there are many additions to the API set that we've been working on over the past couple of years. But um, the, the table stakes are here. You can build fast and reliably performant experiences for your users today. And uh, many of the other constituent technologies of Progress Web Apps are continuing to show up. Um, over time, we're adding more and more and more and getting more and more compatibility across browsers, uh, including things that are going to reduce the friction to engaging heavily with the web and in follow-on dimensions from loading. If PWAs are about getting from a home screen icon into an experience that you want to keep using, things like the Credential Management API, the Payment Request API, um, those are about, uh, and web authentication, those are about um, freeing users from having to type into terrible little tiny form fields on the world's worst keyboards. And we're, we're continuing to, to see that those are getting traction too. So this has been great. Um, Starbucks is succeeding with their progressive web app versus their native app. Uh, and Pinterest, I love these stats. Uh, thank you to, to Addy for putting, pulling them together. Um, they have some, seen an incredible improvement in interaction with their mobile experience, having invested heavily in it and moving to progressive web app technologies. Um, and so compared to their previous website, they're really killing it. But the, the important part about this is that they're also beating their native app counterparts. They didn't stop making a native app when they started working on their PWA. They've been running them as a true A-B experiment. And the reality is that now, when you build it right, and you build it well for those users situated in that environment, you can really compete. And you can compete in aspects that uh, some of the competition can't begin to chase you on. Uh, there is no way to deliver a home feed for Pinterest on an Android device in 150 kilobits as an APK. Doesn't exist, can't do it. This is, this is the way that we win. We, the way that we win is through lower friction, and the web continues to deliver that low friction and broad reach, and now you can also have the re-engagement. So we're not stopping there. Joining our friends at Samsung uh, and Microsoft, we are introducing uh, desktop PWAs for Chrome users, uh, shipping in Chrome 69, or sorry, 68, uh, which is to say it's already out for Chrome for uh, Chrome OS. And this fall, we'll be also bringing this to Windows and Mac and Linux, uh, uh, not, to, not to leave our Linux users off. We've worked heavily to improve the performance of JavaScript. I'm sure you've seen a lot of this. Uh, one weird trick in object.assign uh, helped improve things significantly for uh, users who are uh, experiencing React-based sites, but that is not the, the uh, extent of it. We're continuing to improve real-world performance for real-world JavaScript. Um, uh, taking into account what people are seeing most often as the guide for what we decide to, to crank harder on in V8. Um, I, could, I, I had thought about shrinking the font on this and then like making it two columns and then like tiling it all over and then like just sort of throwing words at you. Uh, there's so much happening. Shubi's going to tell you about some of the, some of the more exciting things. Um, quickly, <laughs> very quickly, uh, things like uh, AV1 are coming. There's no room in the slide to talk about them, uh, but so are uh, things like the payment handler and web packaging and feature policies, which will en enable you to build uh, websites that are consistently performant, no matter what your third parties do. Um, module workers will let you better factor out your code. One tap sign in and sign up will continue to allow you to engage your users more easily, uh, in, in addition to what we're already doing with uh, synchronization web authentication. Um, and we're going to be adding a whole parcel of new device APIs to help you reach more users in more scenarios. If you thought you couldn't build an app that did that, try now. We just added web USB, we added web Bluetooth. Uh, we're going to keep going. Uh, th this train is not yet done. And we're making sure that users are continuing to experience these things in a good way. Um, this was. Uh, Back in the old days, we used to warn you when, when users were going to a secure site. Uh, we've decided that that was doing it wrong. Um, and so the security team has been working their hearts out uh, for the last four, four plus years to arrange an ecosystem-wide change to get us back to the place where we should have started, which is that we should have given you this warning when you were on an insecure site, when someone could have been in the middle between you and the destination server. And so that's the change that we're affecting today uh, for sites with inputs. And this is following on to a collaboration with um, our friends on 
uh, Firefox, who are also taking similar steps to warn their users about uh, experiences where the network is an active participant and not in a good way. So we want your feedback. I think that's the common theme across all of this. And so if you filed out the, uh, the survey earlier, thank you for that. And I want to hand it over to Shubi. Switch over to Shuby and this is yours, right? Okay. Go for it. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Shuby Panicker. I'm a software engineer on the web platform in Chrome. And I'm fairly involved both on the standard side as well as implementation in Chrome. And now that you've had the full overview from Alex, I'll kind of just deep dive into a couple of topics. The first of these being my favorite, which is page lifecycle. Uh, this is an effort I've been leading over the last year and I'll kind of just quickly get into an overview of what this is. So application lifecycle is a key way that enables modern platforms like Android and iOS to manage resources, which is basically reallocate them in a way that best benefits the user. So this sentiment might resonate with some folks here. Uh, this is from a recent Reddit thread, uh, maybe like a year ago with the Chrome team, and this you know, constantly keeps coming up time to time, users even on fairly high-end devices um, using Chrome get into this problem where it feels like you know, the browser is kind of hogging all these resources, not relinquishing memory um, and draining battery and so forth. And so this is the sort of the situation we get into when we don't have the notion of a life cycle. All these apps that are sitting around in the background continue to like, consume all this memory and CPU and drain our devices. And ultimately, this results in bad user experiences. In particular, it hurts responsiveness, causes a lot of jank and kind of sluggishness. Your machine might lock up. Things like foreground loading are pretty bad. And on mobile, it causes additional problems like draining of battery and data. So it's not that the platform didn't have any notion of a life cycle at all. We've had things like load and load visibility change, but they tell us about user-initiated state changes. What we want is that browsers should also have a way to transition apps across these state changes. And because developers don't have a way to find out about the system-initiated changes, it kind of ties our hands up as browsers. You know, we can't just go out and kind of turn down these um, tabs that are not important to the user anymore to reclaim these resources. So this is the gap that the lifecycle um, concept fills in the platform. In particular, it does it by standardizing this, the fuzzy notion of a life cycle and making this a first class thing. We've added a couple of new states that empower browsers to reclaim resources from unimportant pages. And finally, there are API, there's an API surface exposed so developers can learn about this and make sure that their apps are resilient. So this is kind of the final life cycle that we came up with. The blue boxes are basically um, user-initiated state changes, active, passive, hidden, and terminated. And the purple boxes are the new system-initiated lifecycle states that we created. It's frozen state and discarded state. And um, there's events and API surface that tells you when transitions happen here. So concretely, how has this actually helped Chrome users? Um, so, so far, Chrome users have primarily benefited on Android. Uh, we've, over the last year, been shipping the, the sort of freezing interventions, starting with timers and then loading, and now I have a pending intent to ship to basically f uh, freeze everything else. Um, so this is mostly done, and we've seen great wins, both in terms of battery savings as well as data savings. On desktop, we have currently experiments ongoing, and the results are looking really, gr really good. We've seen great reductions in both memory, CPU, as well as wins in foreground loading. So the second topic that I want to very briefly cover is something called feature policy. Uh, this is not something I've been closely involved with, but just something I would love to kind of hear thoughts from this group on. So what is feature policy? It's a way for web developers to big control features, turn them on and off, and um, basically modify behavior of APIs. So you can think of it kind of like CSP, but for features rather than for security. And you can also think of it as like an opt-in agreement between the developer and the browser. So why do we think this is a good idea? Now, building um, performant world-class web apps is not easy. But what's even harder is keeping these apps performant. 
as you know, you get all these different developers flowing through your projects and different features come and go and the code base size sort of evolves year to year, it's really difficult. So policy is a way for developers to express certain invariants and the browser helps them maintain these invariants and keeps them honest. So here are some examples of policies. They can be and everything from like sensitive APIs like camera or microphone to like the so-called bad APIs, sync XHR, document write, um, making sure images are sized properly, etc. And in terms of usage, there's a couple ways to use it. Um, one is through the HTTP header, and I have an example listed here, and the other is through the iframes allow attribute. So that's everything I have. Thanks. Jonathan Sampson from Brave. I'm going to switch machines real quick. Yeah, I just had to bring the Windows machine to this, didn't I? <laughs> no worries. Okay. Thank you. Um, sure. Okay. <laughs> it's oh, way up there, way yeah. Up there. No, no, that's okay. Perfect. I think we should be good. There we go. Nice. So I'm Samson from the uh, Brave team. I work in developer relations there. And uh, this is a pretty neat little event. I'm, I'm happy to uh, be involved. And so thank you, Tracy and Google, for putting all this on. Uh, let me run through some of our updates. So general overview of Brave is a little bit different. We don't talk as much about the uh, the browser platform and the work that we're doing there, uh, or the web platform. But we're talking about uh, some different battles that we're fighting, and those are usually in the area of uh, private by default browsing, browsing, something we're super passionate about. Um, creating principally first a better experience for users, and then secondarily for content creators on the web. Uh, the web has become a pretty scary place. Uh, much in part because of all the amazing things we've been doing in the web platform and with JavaScript. Um, so those amazing tools have been used uh, for evil by some bad actors. Secondarily, uh, we don't want to be just an ad blocker out there. We actually want to take care of content creators who are finding their, their well-being and their living online. And so we also want to reform the digital advertising world, eliminate the middleman, improving the publisher revenue, um, actually creating a, a much better ecosystem for the, the users on the web and the content creators on the web themselves. And so presently, whenever you go to a website, this is kind of what we all expect. It's just me and the website that I'm visiting. But in reality, whenever we go to a website, the ad slots on there are communicating with uh, supply side providers, which are communicating with exchanges, which are communicating with demand side providers, which are communicating with data management providers. And there's a whole lot of just ushering of personal information being sent uh, for every slide or every ad slot on every web page every time you visit it, refresh it, or navigate away, or anything like that. Uh, that's kind of scary when you realize just what's happening with our private data. And in fact, uh, GDPR is in the news a lot lately, and uh, it's something that Europe has been doing for a long time, where users get to have a little more control over this. Uh, but heavy fines are definitely going to change the, the tone of the conversation moving forward. And what we just saw with advertising online today, uh, in a great way, constitutes a personal data breach uh, per Article 4 of GDPR. So the last part of that is, that we actually want to pay more than just the content creators, the publishers on websites. We want to pay the users who are actually visiting, the owners of that limited commodity we all call attention, which is focused mental engagement, something that is so key on the web these days. And we can do so in a GDPR compliant way that is completely opt-in with uh, better targeting, we think. Just a few numbers to kind of explain how Brave is doing. We just uh, announced that we have 3.5 million monthly active users, which is really great for us. We were hoping to get to 5 million monthly active by the end of the year, but it looks like we're going to blow right past that. And five minutes ago, this slide said nearing 10 million Android downloads, but I just got a message from our office saying we just passed 10 million Android downloads, so that's really exciting. And then the, uh, the last portion, the basic attention token portion, which I might talk about uh, in the future here, but we currently have uh, a little over 20,000 verified publishers, including 5,000 websites. 13,500 YouTube creators and more than 1,000 Twitch streamers, which is blowing my mind. That's incredible. One of the other things we did was recently integrated DuckDuckGo more prominently inside uh, our iOS application. 
Um, DuckDuckGo is kind of ideologically aligned with Brave in many ways, and so we're, we're super excited to uh, be working with them. I think they are averaging this month about 24 million daily queries, so they're growing considerably as well. Um, to make private and or incognito browsing a little more private and or incognito, we actually integrated support for private tabs with Tor. Uh, and so anyone who's familiar with uh, the unrouter and, and how that works and the additional anonymity that it brings to the web, this is something that we are pretty excited to ship in Brave as well. And I'm, I'm adding, I should go back here, I'm adding a small blog post uh, links in some of these as well if you want to get some additional details because we have only a little bit of time today to go through any of this. Uh, and uh, you know what, I have to turn on my volume here because this next slide contains audio. So, we also have Brave Ad Trials. Uh, in fact, we are giving users right now a small subset of them uh, access to this. It didn't play the sound. Oh, I'm, I'm heartbroken, but the notification has like a quarter of a second sound that it plays when it comes out. But right now, we actually have uh, custom builds for Brave Ads. This is that local machine learning client-based uh, advertising that is going to be coming more and more to the Brave ecosystem and paying users 70% of the revenue generated from any ads that they choose to see. And as my cool little slider, which took me like an hour to animate this in PowerPoint, by the way, uh, we're letting users dictate how often they see ads, how many ads they see, so on and so forth. So we currently have about, uh, I think we're about to have several hundreds of volunteers helping us further train this machine learning model. Recently did uh, AMAs on Reddit with uh, our co-founders, Brendan Eich, which everyone here knows, and Brian Bondi, who is, uh, has history in Mozilla, Khan Academy. Uh, both of those were just fantastic. We're going to be continuing to do Reddit AMAs in the future. In fact, we've got three uh, participants in September, two in October, November, and then six in December. And we have these planned on into 2019 as well. Uh, one big thing that we're really excited about, too, and it's around user agent strings, which everyone in here knows how painful those are. They have been forever. Uh, it's a bag of lies, and ours is no exception to that. For the longest time, we've been masquerading the web as Google Chrome, uh, and that is to protect users because we're kind of doing some, um, some things that upset a few people on the web. And so with... Uh, with the growing popularity of our Android browser, we're actually getting to the point where we have a significant amount of market share that we can actually add a distinct token to the user agent string and identify ourselves as Brave in the future for those who would uh, wish to, to figure that out. One of the other things we're doing is moving away from our electron fork of Muon and moving to Chromium. So that's going to be coming very soon as well. Uh, we originally forked Electron and uh, created Muon, which was a, a kind of hardened security version of the uh, the very cool Electron project. You know, um, but the further away you get from the Chromium code base, obviously the higher your maintenance costs. Uh, it's just a little bit more difficult to to be as responsive. So with the uh, Brave core that's coming very soon, we're going to be on a three-week cadence and be able to actually uh, take advantage of a lot of the great work that the Chromium team is uh, is doing. Uh, one of the last things I want to mention, too, is uh, refer, brave.com slash refer. So whenever we did our uh, pretty notable token sell back in 2016, we set aside quite a bit of revenue just for the community. We wanted to stake the users. And so we wanted users to support content creators. And so each month we've been giving out $500,000 worth of basic attention token to users of Brave. And uh, we also launched, not too long ago, uh, brave.com slash refer, which was a way for content creators to recoup some of the lost costs from losing ads, uh, losing third-party ads. And this is essentially $5 for every user that they bring onto the Brave platform. And uh, let's see, to get involved with the community, with the project, we've got a couple of major uh, GitHub repos. We have a ton of repos, but these are the two big ones. The very first one, Brave forward slash browser laptop, is our current Muon based browser. The second one, Brave forward slash Brave browser, is the work that's taking place on the Chromium fork. Uh, we also have community.brave.com, which is a discourse instance, and then Brave and Attention Token both on Twitter for anyone who happens to congregate there. That is all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samson. Next up, once we get set up again, we're going to have Martin Robinson from Egalia joining us. So, let's see. Is Martin on the call?
We'll just be a minute dealing with a quick technical issue. Uh, sorry, I was just muted. <laughs> yeah. all right. It's all good? Excellent. Slide. I'll be switching slides for So, okay, uh, I'm ready to go. Hi, um, I'm Martin Robinson, and um, I'm here from Agalia, uh, and I'm a developer there. I'm just going to pull up the slides because I don't see them on my own screen. Um, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, we can move to the next slide. So, um, I don't know, um, some of you have probably heard of Agalia, but I'll just explain, um, what we do. Essentially, we're a Spanish cooperative of contractors with around, uh, 50 people, um, focusing on open source software. Uh, that's part of our core competency. Uh, we're distributed throughout the globe. Um, we have people in the Americas, in Europe, and in Asia. Uh, essentially, we have a decade of web browser experience, uh, working on all sorts of open source, open source web browsers. And personally, I'm part of a very active team of people working directly on the web platform itself. Um, there's a lot of us, and uh, it's sometimes hard to separate the work that we do, but I like to think about the web platform work uh, as two different sort of areas. One is standards, working with standards bodies, and the other is working on the implementation of, uh, of the web platform in, uh, in different browsers. So next slide. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've been working on the past six months. Um, to sort of give you an idea of this, the range of things that we do and um, what we're really excited about. So in terms of JavaScript, our work with CC39 has allowed us to work on a couple upcoming standards that I think are really going to improve things for web developers. The first is BigInt, which allows web developers to use large integers. Um, uh, the floating point representation of numbers doesn't always work well when they get really big. So this will improve JavaScript with certain use cases. The, the next is class fields, which allows developers to annotate um, the members of JavaScript classes, for instance, to make them private, uh, which is essentially adding more object-oriented features to JavaScript itself. Um, and then also, uh, one thing that a lot of developers have told us that they really would like is like a, a standard internationalization API. There are a lot of different JavaScript libraries to do this, but um, having this as a standard makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier to use on the whole. And finally, we've also been working a lot on WebAssembly, the WebAssembly standard, and pushing that forward. The second big area where we do a lot of standards work is with accessibility. And this, uh, this allows browsers to work for people, for instance, who use screen readers, things like that. Um, and we do this by being an active part of the W3C ARIA working group. Uh, we're one of the co-chairs. And we, in the past few months, have been pushing this sort of bureaucratic work of pushing forward specifications um, uh, moving these specifications from from one stage to the next is is a really big a really big uh, a really big job, and so we're happy to see that um, we're moving. Some of these specifications have moved to 
proposed recommendation, others to candidate recommendations, and finally ARIA 1.2 and the core accessibility API mappings are almost ready to move to the draft specification. So you can move to the next slide. Uh, the other side of the work we do is implementation, which means that we're working upstream on almost every open source browser. Um, this includes Firefox, uh, Safari through WebKit, um, as well as Chrome and Servo. So in line with our, spec in line with our specification work, we're implementing at the same time BigInt and SpiderMonkey and JavaScript Core. Um, and this is really nice because it allows us to have this internal feedback when we're working on specifications. Um, and in the same way, we're working on the implementation of class fields in V8. Both really excited about these things. Um, in terms of CSS, we uh, in the past few years, we we're working very hard to get CSS shipping in WebKit and Chrome, CSS Grid, I mean. And uh, we're continuing the work to polish that and uh, sort of remove all the bugs, as well as adding new features from the spec, and also making sure that it works with more extreme use cases, such as really, really big CSS grids. Um, but as of right now, you should be able to use CSS in all modern browsers, CSS grid. Um, in addition, we're working on improvements and additions to CSS text, CSS containment, and improving the CSS styling of elements during editing. Uh, also, as part of our effort to improve web platform predictability, we're improving uh, the sort of uh, uniformity of behavior uh, with scrolling and editing. In particular, editing is one of those areas where there's a lot of differences between the browsers, and it's a very complex uh, part of the code. And finally, um, all of this is sort of bolstered by our work on the web platform tests, which ensure first that the changes we make don't regress, and finally that the behavior is the same across all browsers, which means that it's safe to use by web developers. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So that was just a quick overview of what we've been doing. Um, if you want more information about Egalia and the kind of work that we do, I recommend checking out Frederick Wang's blog post or contacting us online or just finding me on Twitter and asking me any kind of questions you want. I'm happy to answer them. All right, that's all for me, thanks. So uh, we are now going to take a 10 minute break and we'll be back real soon uh, with our discussion topics. So we're breaking for time.
Welcome back to Browser Contributor Days. Um, we are going to kick off a round of discussion topics. Before we do so, we're going to go around the room uh, with a quick intro from each person. So let's kick it off with Samson over on the left. Sure. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sampson, just go by Sampson. Uh, developer relations at Brave, 22 years as a web developer. Um, previous experience was at Microsoft, uh, jQuery, and uh, that's pretty much it. Talk a little bit about like why you're here and what you care about, what you're excited about. Yeah, that's... Uh, no, but um, at Brave, I, anyone who saw the, the presentation earlier at Brave, one of the things we're predominantly looking at is online advertising, reforming that industry to make it safer, uh, more secure, giving users more control over their data, especially in light of uh, things like GDPR. Um, and so that's kind of what we're focusing on with the browser right now. And um, that kind of uh, guides our interest when we're looking at uh, web platform evolution and, and that type of stuff as well. Uh, I'm Ben Lesh. I work at Google right now. I, I used to work at Netflix. Um, I uh, am on the Angular core team and the RxJS core team. Uh, the things I'm excited about right now, uh, outside of reactive programming, which is mostly what I what I'm known for, uh, I really I like being part of this because I, I'm hopeful that that uh, get-togethers like this will result in uh, better experiences for developers trying to make apps faster for for their users. So. Hello, I'm Shubi Panikar. I'm a software engineer on the web platform in Chrome. Um, I guess before Chrome, I have worked on a number of different Google products, um, like mostly web frameworks for search, photos, etc. And I'm kind of excited about this kind of an event because as a framework developer, it was never clear to me how to engage with browsers or standards. Um, and it, we actually, my teams often struggled in those interactions, and they didn't always go very smoothly. So I'm super excited to have uh, framework and web developers be engaged with browser developers. Okay, hi, my name is Dominic Ferlino. I'm just a lowly college kid, a, a senior from the University of Cincinnati uh, in Ohio, so shout out to the Midwest. I'm also a previous uh, Microsoft and Mozilla intern and currently a Chromium project committer. Where various uh, resource loading APIs and projects such as Fetch and Service Worker and uh, some module script loading things. Uh, I've also been working on the experimental implementation of priority hints in Chrome. And so I'm geeked about resource loading and getting people involved in standards community. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Patrick. I'm a member of the Edge team at Microsoft. I have been a web developer for, uh, since I can remember, 20 something years. Uh, and I am really excited to be a part of this sort of a thing. I've been involved in all sorts of open source stuff. I'm one of the maintainers for Modernizer. I'm a contributor to Bower, jQuery, all sorts of major projects. And it's really great to be a part of the community and to help you know, bring people into the browser fold, help them understand how individual people can actually make a huge impact on the future of the web and what comes into the web. I'm Adi Osmani. I'm an engineering manager in Chrome. Um, I care a lot about speed, so we, we spend a lot of time telling people they're shipping too much JavaScript. Um, love JavaScript otherwise. Uh, beyond that, I really care about this event because I think that uh, we still have work to do bridging the uh, the needs of web developers and uh, the desire for web browsers to still give them better capabilities while still ensuring that they deliver good user experiences. And I think that hopefully events like Browser Contributor Days will uh, give us a chance to get even more feedback out there and, and close the loop on places where we're perhaps not filling in the gaps that developers need today. Hello, my name is... Uh Oh, do I just have to hold it? I don't even know. Okay. My name is Tracy, uh, also Lady Lead on Twitter. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to do Browser Contributor Days uh, with Addy was because I think there's there's conversations that need to happen uh, cross between the different browsers. And I always feel like if you can just put everybody in a room together and just have conversations, I've seen really amazing things come out of other contributor days. Like uh, Angular team came to RxJS contributor days and complained about the size. And then all of a sudden, Ben made it like way smaller. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so anyways, those types of things are really exciting um, and interesting interesting to me. Um, I'm a Google developer for the web and Angular. I'm also on the RxJS core team and help lead the docs initiatives. And I also do uh, community relations for the Node Foundation. So excited to be here today and talk. Hi, I'm Alex Russell. I'm a software engineer on the web platform team in Chrome, along with Shuby, and closely with Addy on telling people that their websites are slow. Uh, I'm mostly interested in making sure that the web can be competitive in markets where it doesn't exist or exist in a prevalent way today. So for the next billion users to come online, they will mostly come online uh, on low power devices, on what we would consider to be flaky networks, and the web has to work well for them, uh, or the web won't grow with their use of computing. And so uh, the set of challenges that are between here and there are large and they're going to involve a lot of cultural change in, in our community. Um, and that's mostly going to be a question of understanding the data that we're seeing, trying to make sense of it, and then listening to what developers are telling us about what they need. So we're, we're here to listen. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie. Um, I'm a PM on the Microsoft Edge web platform team. My role is a little bit different. I have a background in web design and user experience design and then some front-end development experience. So I manage our developer portal, and uh, the WebHint website is my baby. Um, <laughs> Nelly the Narwhal is my daughter. <laughs> um, and today I'm just excited to hear from developers to see how Edge can better support a good developer experience. Cool. Uh, I'm Nuit Herald, uh, DHG Herald on, on, the, on the Twitters. And I am the front manager for the developer experience team, which includes uh, web compit, developer tools, performance tooling, everything that, that we can ensure that the web stays compatible, open, and accessible to all, and fast. <laughs> so then that's, that's, uh, the, that's based on my experience also a lot, reaching out to previous, previous lives and as partner engineer, talking to sites, how developers work on the web, the struggles that they have. Um, and it's often that, that you come as a somebody from a browser and you come down from the heavens and tell them, like, you can talk to me. So it's really exciting to see everybody in the room and like opening this up that you can talk to browsers, you can file bugs, that you can influence how uh, APIs are being made, how problems are being solved, and how this can shape up not just how APIs are being made, but also what tools are being provided, and the whole trend trend pipeline, how, how it's being tested. And that's a lot of like how browsers worked, I think, in the past month, that there's more ways, more, more pushing towards getting browsers into the critical path for testing, like headless uh, browsers for testing, um, automation. So that's, that's what you could see. Hi, I'm David Barron. Um, I'm also with Mozilla. I'm a software engineer um, working mostly on layout and CSS code, but also in some other areas. I've also been involved with CSS standardization and some other standards activity at W3C and the working group for a long time. And I'll, like many others, I'm here because I'm interested in hearing what is important to developers and to designers about what we're adding and fixing on the web platform. And I think we have um, a few folks online as well. Maybe we want to start with Jay. Hey, everyone. So uh, I'm Jay Phelps. I'm, uh, I'm a co-founder at this dot, and I previously worked at Netflix. And when I was at Netflix, I did developer experience, so that sort of thing is my bag and my obsession. And uh, I'm excited to, to be here and to help put this on so that we can bring all these browsers together, bring all these important people, and uh, just show that, that they're not... Um, they're not hidden. You guys can, everyone can reach out at any point and ask questions, not just here, but, um, you know, on Twitter, email, they all have uh, bug trackers and stuff like that. Just want to make that all clear. Um, as far as stuff that I'm interested in, uh, WebAssembly is the biggest thing that I'm interested in. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you probably know that. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks. And then uh, Kenneth? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is... Okay. Kenneth Christensen. Um, I am a browser engineer at Intel. I've been working on browsers around 10 years. 
Uh, now I mostly work on, on standards as well as strategy, see like how we at Intel can help move the web forward as well as like how we can benefit from it, or at least align ourselves with where the industry is moving. So um, I'm really, I really love the web. It's a great open uh, platform where I think that everyone can have its place. So I just want to make the web like it should remain open. It should remain capable so people can create these experiences they want that can be fast and immersive and of course work for everyone, whether you live in India or in the US or Europe. Um, so at Intel, we've been working a lot of, work on a lot of different things like the immersive web device APIs, such as sensors, Bluetooth, media capabilities, camera representation APIs, and even web assembly as well as progressive web apps. So um, I'm always excited to hear about like what developers need for the web, um, so that we can make it um, work better for them. Awesome. Thank you. And last one is Martin. Hi, I'm, I'm Martin, Martin Robinson, and um, I'm a software developer at Egalia. Um, I've been working a long time for a long time on graphics in both WebKit and in Servo in Gecko. And most recently, I'm working on accessibility in Chrome. So I'm really excited about, one, um, making sure that the experience on the web is fast, and what are the steps involved in that as far as improving the browser side, but also improving the content to the point that it's snappy. Uh, and also making sure hearing from developers uh, about their experiences uh, around accessibility and making sure that the web is available to all users, uh, regardless of how they're browsing the web. And finally, I want to say I'm really excited about this event because it's these events that connect browser developers and front-end developers, people who work with the web platform are really exciting because I think there's still a huge communication gap between those two camps. And a lot of times, although we try, we, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that, um, that we're talking to each other and that we're learning from each other. So that's another reason I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Cool. So we have a broad range of uh, topics that have been brought up by developers, so we'll, we'll dive straight in. Um, we asked developers in our survey, do you feel like web browsers are focused on solving the right problems right now? If not, what problems do you think they should be exploring? And one of the interesting points that people brought up was that they didn't feel like browsers were solving the right problems as often as they could be. Um, one particular comment said, instead of fun futuristic things that are nice to have, like Houdini, there are some basic everyday aspects that developers jump through hoops and hoops of hacks and unnecessary JavaScript to get done. Basic things like custom select dropdowns, custom checkboxes, making them accessible that developers have to hide the browser defaults for because designers don't want to deal with them, um, browsers don't give you the right style styling hooks to give you control over them. Um, is that something that browser vendors should be focusing on a little bit more than we do today? I'm happy to dump, jump right in. Um, so my background is as a web developer, I'm fairly new to working on a browser about three years now. And that's literally the exact example I would give coming into my interview was that why the hell can I have a styleable select dropdown? That's something I've had to recreate 50 times. And it turns out that it is insanely uh, complex. Like there's all sorts of logic and stuff that goes into it. Not only that, when you're talking about a feature that gets released on the web, you have to have a whole bunch of different companies with a whole bunch of different priorities simultaneously agree on how to style a select dropdown. Otherwise, we have five unique ways to style a dropdown. It's something that takes a lot of time. Uh, this is actually a specific thing that I am looking into right now, but uh, it ended up being that what would really make the most sense is building this kind of on top of uh, web component-like features. Um, and so, you know, working at Microsoft Edge, we have a lot of work going into making uh, web components actually work so that everyone can ship them across all major browsers. But you know, we, we really try to reuse the correct tooling when we create new features on the web. I feel like when we're having a new standard, we make sure it fits inside of the existing ecosystem. Um, there are greenfield projects like Houdini that are fascinating, and they're sort of moonshot sort of things. Uh, they're great, but at the same time, the teams that are working on Houdini aren't necessarily the exact same people that would be working on fundamental pieces. It's, it's a prioritization issue as well, but you know. 
So one thing I want to mention is that for the longest time, it felt like you know as browsers we would only focus on low-level primitives. And it's very quite recently that I'm seeing the, you know the sort of momentum towards how about we make some higher level primitives available. And so I would say layered APIs is an example of such a thing. We've been recently having discussions around what if we had a standardized virtual scroller or a standardized async local storage implementation. So I mean, I think this is one um, aspect that I see kind of concretely that's addressing something in this realm. Do you want to? Uh, I was just hoping for a quick summary on layered APIs in case some of the audience wasn't familiar. I, I, can, I can give, give a, summary, a summary if it's, it's fine. fine. <laughs> Go for it, Kenneth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so um, do, do, I'm, I'm hearing, hearing myself, myself double, double, so I don't know if someone could mute me. me. OK, so this is probably better. So. Um, the idea is on the web we've been working on, this called like the extendable web manifesto, try to make low level APIs that work for, for that are extendable. So that instead of trying to to believe that we know the use cases, uh, people should make like low level APIs so people can build on top of them. So because they stay on the web forever. Um, so everything is like when you do specs, you look at the use case, you come up with the use cases, you make these low level APIs and people can build things. And that's all great. But the problem is that if you're like, for instance, a big company moving from native to the web, you go to the web and like, it doesn't have all of these things that you need. You need like more like higher level primitives. Um, so you start like browsing around for all these different libraries, but it's really, really difficult because first of all, like you find a library, but you know which one of these five should I use? How is it maintained? Will it be maintained five years from now? So that's really, really a bad state to be in. Plus, of course, like it also, when you're using one of these libraries, you have to download it. So it also makes your app start up load, like slower. So it's not just typing in that URL. Maybe you have to wait like five seconds before it's loading. So that's really bad. So I think it's a really good idea to bring like higher level APIs to the web. But the problem is that adding all these to the browser makes the browser grow. We're always talking about like memory consumption and whatnot. So it should really be something that's only loaded when you need it. Um, and also not becoming a task on the core of the web browser, making it harder to maintain, making it harder to add like new feature. Um, so the idea with layered APIs is that you will define some new APIs uh, as JavaScript APIs, look at the same level as JavaScript, so that they can be implemented in JavaScript. So it could be a library. But because it's only defined in that way, you could also go and implement it natively. Uh, so it's actually shipped with the browser and it might even be able to do like certain set of optimizations. Um, so currently um, there's people at Google looking at the uh, certain sets of layered APIs. One of them is async local storage. So because everyone loves local storage and say like, yeah, why can't we have an async version of that? So that already exists in, in, as different libraries. But the idea is that why didn't we just add that then to the browser itself? Well, the problem was with async local storage is that you could already do this on uh, um, by yourself because you have index uh, DB. So, so the browser engineers working on the core, for instance, of uh, Firefox and Chrome will say, no, we don't want to add that because it's just like adding more crunch to the to the core engine. But with layered APIs, this could be implemented as a separate module because you have modules on the web now. So this could be implemented in JavaScript for browsers that don't support it already. It's kind of like a standard library, but for the rest, it could also be shipping, for instance, with Chrome. So you will say like, please import this async local storage module. And it will, if it's available in the browser, it will just use the native implementation. Otherwise you could give it like a fallback polyfill that you can uh, download. So this is really, really cool. The other API people are looking at is a virtual scroller. This is something I believe have been missing on the web for a long, long time, because it's something very basic today, especially on mobile. Everyone wants these like infinite scrolling lists that are high performant. And a lot, some of us, like especially browser engineers like myself, I could go and implement such a list because I know how the engine works, but it's really, really difficult for a lot of people. And when people would even with toolkits to implement these, then mostly like solving like few use cases, like this is the exact use case I want. But then maybe I want a scrolling list that have dismissible items, or I want to have like fixed headers that stay at the top while I'm scrolling, uh, for instance, for, for a contact list. So the idea is that coming up with a great API that could be implemented using um, like a JavaScript library, but also be implemented in the browser and be highly optimized. Uh, that would be really, really great. It kind of like, brings the best of both worlds. 
I don't want to be too quarrelsome um, with, the, with the original question. I will just note that um, one person's uh, nice to have feature is another person's blocker. So if you were trying to make a a high performance ripple animation to meet the material design guidelines that some someone in your organization has mandated that you use and you want to make that perform on a low end device today um, it's it's actually almost impossible to do that without the Houdini APIs and so there is a lack of layering there, which is the same thing that the question um, the questioner or the respondent uh, uh, noted about the select element. We have we have insufficiently layerized the input elements such that it isn't possible to provide your own version of the accessibility hooks or the styling or the theming or the shadow DOM for that element. And so in all of these cases, if you if you walk back to this and look at it from the perspective of, are there enough layers in this onion that I can only replace the one that I want? The answer is no. And and I think it's I think it's maybe not always wrong, but certainly in some cases misdirected, to identify somebody else's pain point as something that is inessential for delivering great experiences, because it might just mean that that will be your pain point in six months. And so I think it's worth all of us having a little bit of humility and a little bit of understanding about the pain that we will suffer ourselves in the future, but that our, our coworkers and cohort also suffer at the lack of bad layering. Let's identify layering as the problem and the lack of it as a solution, or more of it as a solution, rather than saying those people over there who want that thing that's blocking them um, shouldn't get what they want. Um, I, I, I would also address the the original question about form controls in, a, I guess, a somewhat similar way, which is that we've been talking about trying to do better styling for form controls for years, probably f over 15 years, and. When we talk about doing something like that, we end up realizing that we need something, we, we need a, uh, some serious system for describing how components work and describing how to style them. And web, if you look at the predecessor efforts that have gone into web components, you know, we've had HTCs, we've had XBL, SXBL, XBL2, um, multiple iterations of web components in Shadow DOM. That's been going on for over 15 years, and it looks like we're finally getting to something that is interoperable and shipping. And at some point soon, it probably is going to be the right time to actually look at form controls and try and build something that is more stylable and more layered than what we have today. Um, that said, if I did it, I would probably not do select first. I would probably do select last. Yeah, so on this list of tasks here, if we we're going to take the select element specifically, I think we should we should identify the layers and break them up and talk about them independently. And there is good news here, right? It's not like the, the Chrome team is relatively large. We have lots of collaborators. Thank you to Algalia and Intel and Bloomberg and everyone else. Um, we have lots of folks working on these problems, and we are investing in these areas, but we're investing in them from all the different aspects. So there is an unreified data model inside of a select element. There is an undescribed MVC mechanism by which you change the value of the selected option and then the UI updates. How does that happen? There is the styling question about if I got something rendered, how do I style it? There's a question about how the accessibility things are hinted in reaction to all of these other internal events. Good news, that's being worked on through the accessibility object model work. You can go find that in the YCG uh, GitHub repo and leave comments there about their latest designs. I think it's actually looking, shaping up to be pretty good and we're hoping to get something out um, in short order. Uh, but if you, if you can decouple those questions from each other, you can start to address them individually and realize that it may not be that you want to style select. It may that you, be that you want an option list that is stylable. And it may be in the next couple of years, the best option will be to create a web component that does roughly this, that allows you to style it, but retains the good accessibility um, of the select element because you're able to reuse more and more and more of the internals that we are continuously exposing better and better over time. What would you all say to people who, uh, developers who are just like, can't we just have X? You know, it seems so simple sometimes, uh, maybe from a developer perspective to say like, this should be easy, why can't we implement it? Uh, why, you know, why are other things being worked on? But how do people find the long explanations? <laughs> for, is it on the web anywhere? Where do people look? Well, there was a, 
tweet that went out last year that was something like, we'll have, it's ridiculous that we'll have web VR across all browsers before we have um, container queries. The idea of like, if an element is above 600 pixels, do a different design. And while I completely understand the frustration that comes with that, because there is, you know, that's a, the, problem that container queries are trying to solve is something that has been a fundamental missing feature from the web for a very long time. It's not as though the team that's solving web VR would stop their virtual reality work and then go work on, you know, like underlying container work inside of the engine. Those aren't the same engineers when it gets down to it. Like these are individual people that are interested in it. So keep in mind that there are different teams that are tasked. We hired, like at Microsoft, we hired people on the Xbox team to work on web VR because they're fascinated with virtual reality. Um, Secondly, uh, I think it goes back to things that um, both Alex and David have said around it's there's a lot of work that has to go into these things over time. Like David mentioned, there's been multiple failed attempts at getting the idea of what we would potentially use componentization inside of a select box. And sometimes it just takes time, so it might not feel like we're doing the right thing, but there's a ton of effort under the covers going on in the standards body, like the uh, WICG that uh, Alex mentioned or other attempts that are trying to be made. Um, and then Finally, if it's something that people really, really want, start talking about it. You know, all of our browsers prioritize features based off of feedback from users, from developers. If you want something, tell us, be loud. I mean, that's why the responsive images were so successful so quickly. We had a bunch of people really passionate about it. We got funding for it. We got it made. So, yeah. So we I, okay. Okay. I, I also think that's the... The problem on, on the web is that like if you're working on your own project and you feel like I just need this API, well then you don't see all the different corner cases because you don't have them in your project. But if you're adding something to the web, it kind of needs to work for more than just your use case. Otherwise we'll end up with like 500 very similar APIs. And when it gets into the browser, we get to we have to have all the different browsers implemented and it will stay there forever. So if we didn't get this API right, if there's security problems, if it doesn't really solve the use cases, then we have to deal with it forever. And and it will be just like a chunk uh, a problem for the web browsers because it's there in the code, it has to be maintained, and that is taking engineering resources away from actually adding these new features. One example could be, for instance, like app cache. It's there still, and, and it still needs to be maintained. And if you find the security issues, they have, they have to be fixed. Uh, and that's like taking resources away from doing uh, other cool stuff. had looks to the outside how where we focus it's really intense like vr in firefox was implemented by one engineer working with another engineer on the google side initially drafting out a spec building a prototype making it work making it look nice and that's all that's that's like initially but for the first months that's that's all they did it looked like we we're having this heavy push for vr and then the other side we moved from native elements for selects to building them in web technology in the browser and that took a team of multiple engineers just to make selects against both CSS and nice looking because then we could actually apply styles within the browser but just with the web combat impact with the browser we architecture had to work with the front-end team and, and, and the platform teams there's a lot more effort going on just to get that simple thing going versus shipping a VR thing first so yeah, life is easy if you don't have any users of the feature already. I mean, that, that, that's just a sort of an iron rule. It's it's much harder to change a system that is already heavily constrained by use than it is to add a greenfield thing. So that's the part of the calculus. There's some oddities with, uh, well, sorry, I can hear myself. Um, with form controls as well, and particularly like the, the select is kind of a, a key one because that one is manifested differently if it's on desktop versus on mobile versus on tablets and that type of stuff. You have to take all those into consideration. It's not just, you know, dropping a box down. It's not it's not a div that you can just appear on screen. So there's a lot of complications uh, involved in those types of things. So we talked about potentially being in a position uh, in a few years to potentially explore like improving uh, styling and control of forms, maybe offering up better baked in components that uh, the ecosystem are currently using JavaScript libraries for. How can we ensure that any of these efforts um, factor in the input from framework authors and library authors who probably have strong opinions on this? Because as browser vendors, we might have you know uh, insight into what we think makes sense, but how can we ensure that the ecosystem's experience is factored in as well? 
I think Tracy's single-handedly taking care of that <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with these types of meetings. This is definitely helping. Well, one key thing to keep in mind is that standards is an open process for the most part. I mean, like it's uh, it's something that happens in the open. The minutes of the meetings are available publicly. There's you know you can contact mailing lists to give feedback on features. But probably the biggest breakthrough in the last few years in browsers is the early release cycles that I think Chrome really pioneered with the Canary releases. Uh, and uh, Edge has the um, Insider previews and Firefox and Safari and uh, just about all browsers I assume break does as well I'm unstable uh, I trust my privacy a little bit more unstable but um, you know all browsers have these really really early use patterns and that's something where we can be toying with a feature and it might even be on by default in a preview build but when once that same build gets upgraded to stable it gets deactivated it gets put behind a flag effectively and so making sure that as a web developer you are testing features in pre-release browsers as often as possible I think is a really important thing We've heard from sorry, apologies. Uh, we've heard from a lot of web developers that it's it's nice to have things behind a flag and or or even on by default in a canary or dev build, um, but that doesn't really help them determine whether or not it's going to work in the real world. And so um, we've been trying to open up all. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. One of the things that I do uh, is um, I also help manage our standards work on the Grim team. So we have a vested interest in making sure that um, our process takes as much feedback in as early as possible because, uh, like Kenneth mentioned, when we get it wrong, it costs a lot. And it costs a lot in time, right? The, the appetite to go back and relitigate a feature like App Cache requires developers basically pulling their hair out yelling and threatening to you know show up at our doorsteps with pitchforks uh, before you know you're gonna go take limited resources again and put them on a problem that you thought you had solved so being wrong not getting that feedback not paying attention to the data early on uh, is can, can be fatal um, not just to solving the problem in the short run but but even having the appetite to try to solve it correctly in the long run so uh, we're intensely focused on making sure that we build the right thing. We phrase it as we need to build the right thing. Um, I wrote a couple of blog posts about some of the ways we're trying to reform this recently, but the, the TLDR is we want your feedback, but understand that as web developers, your time scale is different to ours, right? You're going to view a feature being quote unquote available when it's available to something like 90% of your users. And that means that all the web browsers basically have to agree. Now, we also know that there are early adopters. There are folks who are willing to take risks. And so we want to enable the folks who are able to take risks and give us quick feedback and not build a global service that has to reach a billion users um, to do so and then help, help evolve those features with us. Framework authors have similar incentives to browser vendors. They want to cover the 80 to 90% of the user base. And so in many cases, framework authors are not a great source of early user feedback. Um, so we're looking for adventurous developers and we're trying to enable them. So. Um, Processes like incubation at the web incubation community group, the web VR community group, um, many of the, of the new proposals that are happening in community groups um, are great places for you to jump in and say, I think I, this thing is going to need. Um, and we won't be able to build it in a time scale that's going to help you on your current project, but we will take that into account. Um, things that are more actionable include things like the system called Origin Trials that we've recently been launching many new features uh, in the web platform, at least in Chromium-based browsers, behind. And Origin trials allow you to, to get a key for your website that flips a flag for live users. So stable versions of Chrome, including the billions of users that, that use Chrome today, can try out these experimental features on your website um, so long as your website isn't too big and under the terms that you know that we're going to take it away from you and that you have to give us your email address so we can tell you when we're going to break it because uh, we promise to break it in the future. But it's a great way for us to get early feedback from you. So if you're interested and engaged and have a little bit of time but not a ton of attention and can't sustain the interest for multiple years and read the minutes of standards meetings and go and travel to standards bodies, um, it's an easy way for you to tell us uh, when something that we think might solve a problem does or doesn't and that's critical feedback for us we're looking for it all the time so thank you for for even giving that a look so i'll add to, uh, to that well thank you alex for actually writing those blog posts and the standards process it's actually incredibly helpful and i've been following them in the last years and um, one of the things is kind of finding these early partners and it's often a struggle to find these people so I'm actually kind of heartened by the fact that developers are interested. Uh, I do want to note that it's not like 
free in you know like it actually takes some effort on both sides uh, so this is kind of why sometimes these relationships don't pan out or don't work out because it's not just about like it takes some effort to actually read through our proposals and sort of you know detach from your today's problem and think about kind of you know a year out or what the future of your framework or um, app might look like and how this API can help um, but to the extent that there are you know developers like that that is an incredible resource and I would love for them to help us by you know, all the things that Alex mentioned, like giving us feedback in YCG discourse or even like the YCG explainer repos. Like those are some of the earliest um, points in the pipeline where it's that whether feedback is like incredibly useful. And then beyond that, of course, origin trial partnering is helpful as well. Oh, sorry, I just want to. I think. Well, quick okay. clarifier for anybody that's listening, the YCG being mentioned is the Web Incubator Community Group, the WICG. That's very uncomfortable to say, so it becomes YCG. But uh, it's where the web community can become involved in the really early standards process, and it's a very warm, welcoming community. I think that one of the problems that that uh, regular developers have is that like I, I follow what's going on on the web I read Twitter I, I know kind of like what what, what Mozilla is working on what Google is working on uh, but I think it's for a lot of developers they, there's like there's a lot of features they care about but they don't have like a one place to go to to find out like this is all what the Chrome team is trying to work on in standards and whatnot this is what the Firefox guys are looking at it's really difficult I know that myself I would go to something like chromestatus.com and and you can kind of follow you does thing like link to like the standards but I think this is probably one of the issues that we need to solve because I talk to a lot of people when I go to conferences like, yeah I really need this like yeah but people are already working on that and it's like oh really yeah and here's the link uh, so I see this popping up again and again open is like what are you working on what are you planning what is our position on something and I, when I Switch to the platform team in the past. I was working before on the platform status page to subdue to Chrome status. Just had a page that somebody can go to. Is, is it do you like it? Do you not like it? Did you think about it? And now we actually have a GitHub repo standards positions to where this is actively discussed. You can follow discussions. You can jump in and bring your use case. So it's a lot easier across browsers to follow this now. There's not like one page to go to because even like other pr browsers that try to manage other browsers positions they're like not always doing doing the best job like following it's, it's hard to update so it's it's a it's extra work and mdn hopefully makes these eventually with web Compit data maybe at some point overlap so we and we did in the past i think also and edge does it somewhat with the user uh voice um, platform just giving people a place where they can bring their vote they can bring their plus plus one that they like something and we did this in the last planning cycles we posted uh surveys on twitter so people can jump in and pile up. Hey, do you want to have uh, CSS containment? Do you want to have which, which CSS APIs do you need? And just the, the people, a few people, at least on Twitter, it's not a perfect platform to run surveys. <laughs> so there's caveats, but it just like, have a have a temperature sense from the from that and from our outreach. So I think every browser has mailing lists with with companies with frameworks. So there's a lot of back and forth on these things. So they they do exist occasionally. If it's just hard to communicate everybody, but usually like if, if Frameworks want to reach out. They they definitely know somebody. They they yeah could so. So this uh, this seems like a good point to mention one of the, the questions that we asked in our developer survey. So we asked developers, do you have any questions about getting involved with web standards? So TC39, WICG, W3C are contributing back to browsers. And two or three of the answers kind of jumped out to me. Um, one person mentioned, you know, uh, how can someone who's not a browser vendor and unable to persuade them otherwise stop browsers from shipping something that other other members of the ecosystem feel is unwise. Uh, another person mentioned, uh, I feel that by the time feedback has been asked for, decisions have already been made, an implementation has started, most opinions feel like they've already been discussed, and I feel like my own feedback is kind of muted. Um, I was interested, actually, from someone who's uh, not currently working for a browser vendor, uh, what Dom Ferralino's input on this was. You've kind of contributed to web standards, you've contributed to browsers. Mm -hmm. How have you found the process? Of 
Um, I find the process pretty nice. I mean, it's worth reiterating exactly what Patrick said. The process is entirely open uh, to anybody. And I know IRC can be a scary place. So if you have a quick question, I think it's actually worth just trying to, you know, jump on like a platform like IRC Cloud. And uh, there's a, the What Working Group channel has an IRC or uh, has a channel on Freenode for you to ask things. People are always really responsive there. Um, a lot of the owners are always on there. Also, it's worth really mentioning that um, the What uh, repositories all have uh, an issue called the, like a label called Good First Issue for people people to, you know, new contributors, whether they work at a vendor or not, to jump in and, and make, you know, sometimes editorial change, sometimes smaller normative changes. Um, and that's exactly how I got and started, actually. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of led to this because I didn't know it existed because it's a little buried uh, in some ways. And, um, and I just started making, you know, small changes, uh, editorial in nature in the beginning, uh, larger uh, after some time, and then just refactoring. And then I ended, ended up started looking at the implementation of some of the standards that I was working on uh, and was sort of um, involved on both sides of the coin then. So I think it's it's really easy to get started. It's scary to um, actually go ahead and do it and find some of the places, but there's usually an issue open up on, on one of the relevant standards uh, that you know is always welcome to your opinion. Uh, and again, jumping on IRC and asking some questions there. Um, if you if you, you know, keep in mind the What Working Group's logo, Logan, slogan, sorry, um, of uh, please leave your sense of logic at the door. I think that will help you and take you a long way because obviously things like IndexedDB, we know it has a terrible API and things like that. So you're not just going to jump on and be like, hey, you know, let's kind of just get rid of this. And you're not going to really, you know, convince a lot of people on that. Uh, I think that's kind of an example that has been used, uh, a canonical example that has been used over the years. But, yeah, if you come in uh, and you're sensible and you, you kind of, you know, look at some of the problems that you're dealing with, um, more than just, like, come in with, you know, pitchforks of blazing and, and solutions in hand and everything, uh, people are really responsive to that, and they'll help you, you know, guide you into the right direction and, and how to contribute. And as far as um, being a non and actually influencing some of the way that the standards are, are written. There's actually a really good issue open up right now in the What Working Group's meta repository about what an interested implementer means. So right now, the process for the What Working Group to get some normative change actually in the standard or something like that involves having uh, two Implementers um, approve its, you know, addition or, or uh, reduction of the standard. Um, and there's a lot of APIs like Fetch and URL that have application outside of web browsers. And so there's an issue open on the meta repository talking about is it possible to, you know, propose to the steering group, um, you know, having a non 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 browser vendor actually uh, influence some of the standard and carry some weight into what can be changed and what can't be. So I would say check out that. It's, I think it's the f most recently opened issue on the meta repository. Um, so definitely check some of those things out and just start getting involved and asking questions and people are really responsive and willing to help. I'd, I'd like to actually ask a question about it. There was recently a bit of a kerfuffle with YouTube uh, supporting Web Components version zero, like that uh, kind of earlier one, which was a more or less a breaking version from the one that was kind of supported by most browsers today. I'd be really interested in hearing what get made the feedback happen? Like something called some kind of feedback occurred that made web components become changed in a way that was no longer backward compatible. Um, so maybe somebody from the Chrome team or somebody, Alex, can give feedback on how that feedback was received. Yeah, so um, full disclosure, uh, I helped start and lead the project that um, designed and built out the uh, web components and ES6 features like classes and promises and things like that uh, as, as a unified um, sort of effort to try to make it easier to build modern web applications. So that was our, that was our mission, um, and we built a bunch of things in service of that mission. Uh, one of them was the set of things that we call web components. And so web components, like a lot of these sort of big efforts, um, are not one thing. They are a, a, a set of pieces that fit together to eventually get you a Voltron-like um, outcome, hopefully. And maybe you're missing a leg, maybe you're missing an arm or a sword. Um, but the, the hope is that, uh, you know, the, the unit is still functional on the other side of this. And so uh, additions like classes help you say what you mean um, when you're declaring a component. And uh, the custom element registry helps you uh, tell the system and the parser that you want to participate as part of that in a layered way. So these things fit together in a, in a sort of... Um, uh, very carefully constructed way with a very small critical path, hopefully. Um, and the details are impactful to the implementations, and so they matter. And the details um, 
were very contended. So the first version of the of the custom element spec were designed with the assumption that ES6 classes would continue to drag on. I, I'm sad to say that they did, um, <laughs> but uh, the, the assumption was that that effort was going to take so long that it wasn't worth holding the train um, to get something uh, as an integration point into the parser for that to happen. And so this whole prototype swizzling design uh, played out, and it has deep implications for the rest of the design of the system. And so if you don't um, understand where the critical parts of the design are, it's, it's hard to understand those implications and, and how they follow on from there. And so there was some indigestion about that, but we sort of, you know, moved on and said, well, it's, it's going to have to be like that. And then um, time passed. Uh, we weren't able to convince other browser vendors that the pain that developers were telling us that they felt about a lack of a component system was real. And so we didn't get many bites on really partnering on the Web Components effort. Uh, this was in a much earlier era where we had to continue to try to collaborate inside of the WebKit uh, project to try to move any of the code to make this happen downfield. And that was... Um, that was, again, a, a challenge, right? It wasn't clear that folks who were focused on DOM performance cared a lot about this thing, which might regress DOM performance in certain areas. And so um, these are personal and political projects. And so what that means is uh, differences of opinion or differences in priorities, more, more, more usually differences in, differences in focus and priorities, create opportunities for delay. And so I, I want to try to answer both of the questions that were asked, the, how do I stop something from happening, um, and then and how did this, this thing that took forever eventually happen. Oh, what I'll say is, if you can convince a browser engineer um, working on, on an engine that something is a fatally bad idea, you can probably delay it for a very long time. That's that's probably uh, a possible, probable thing to do. Not forever. The dynamics of the ecosystem works out such that if if three browser engines get together and say say they're all going to do it, the fourth will eventually do it. Um, but uh, but if you can if you can convince two not to do it, you're, you've you've pretty much stopped the train in its tracks. And that's roughly what happened with Web Components v zero. Um, it got to the point where we decided. Uh, partially at my behest, so apologies to those who are suffering the pain of it, um, that no one was going to pay attention to this lack of componentry, this this lack of in, this inability to share components across projects and across frameworks and across this endless churn of front-end tooling um, until such time as we made this real. And so we eventually pulled the proverbial trigger and apologies for the, the maybe poor choice of metaphor, but uh, we eventually launched the ship and set it sailing with V0 and said, double dog dare you not to do something here. And so that eventually brought other browser vendors back to the table and that caused us to come to the agreement about V1. And time had passed and so we could use classes. We could use the super mechanism to do the, the prototype hooking. We could design the nicer thing that we wanted because we had gotten somewhere down the path with ES6. And so um, that's brinksmanship. That is, that is an unfortunate instance in which progress was gated on the construction of, of need um, in the minds of the people who hold the reins of power. Um, and it was necessary to, to make uh, difficult choices to move something down the field, and not in a comfortable way for anyone. Um, but that is sometimes what it takes. So, so the, the, the hard outcome here is that it is easy to stop something. It is easy to say no to needs. It is easy to help people um, not do what they didn't want to do. Uh, it is much harder to take the side of developers and push forward with something that, um, you, through study, you have evidence that they need. Um, I can't say that we did it right. I, I think we did have a bunch of costs involved there. We're still paying for some of them, and so apologies for that. Um, but that's the story. All right, so on to our next question. Um, we asked developers, do you feel like you understand how to measure and optimize the performance of your sites? If not, could you describe what you find confusing or difficult? Um, we received a number of different answers to this. Uh, I'm not going to read them all out in detail. Uh, the TLDR is that folks found that measuring has gotten a lot more easy. Um, hopefully, thanks to you know tools like DevTools, Lighthouse, uh, WebHint. Um, but optimization itself is still really tricky. And a follow-up question we had was, how could browsers band together to make modern app development ensure guarantees of good user experience or fast by default apps? What are the incentives that are necessary? What strategies could work? Because the current approach of providing tools, metrics, encouragement, and admonishment via our tooling um, is necessary, but it doesn't seem sufficient. 
So I don't want to keep hogging the mic, but I'm always happy to jump in. Um, I, I kind of push back against the, the premise of the question a little bit that with the tooling and the metrics and everything else are not enough to a certain extent because well, I, I, much like I think most of the people in the room have been a web developer for a long time and it's a hell of a lot better world today than it used to be. Like I, I used to have to debug with alerts writing code in Notepad. That, like, we couldn't have a web anywhere near as fast as we have today. Um, I think the things, uh, how do we can make it a more expectation of fast by default is a mixture of things. There's uh, got to be an increased integration of tooling, like uh, Web Hint inside of uh, like Edge's dev tools, Lighthouse inside of Chrome's dev tools. Hopefully Firefox can adopt one. Web Hint is great. Um, but the the idea of having these things sort of in there, uh, and then, you know, I can tell you that uh, as a browser, we work with a lot of high-priority websites, websites that are constantly constantly browsed in a lot of different countries to try and make sure that those experiences are as fast as possible. We use the latest web technologies and sites that people go to, and the more we do that, the more users expect a website that loads instantly or near instantly, and hopefully that can sort of shame slower websites over time. Um, that being said, efforts like the AMP effort, uh, as uh, diverse of an opinion as what AMP is as a whole, the idea of uh, actively taking on the public industry to make it so that your websites that take 90 seconds to load no longer have to. I think Brave has showed how incredibly fast news websites can be if you don't block, if you don't log out, uh, open up all the ads and 55 tracking cookies that they have inside of it. Um, and, you know, maybe Samson can talk a bit more about how what web, the web needs to change to be faster by default. I, I would actually be, um, uh, if anyone told me to my face that the current tooling was insufficient, I would have to ask for specifics as to how it could be improved because, as you said, over the last 22 years, um, I've never seen anything as good as what we have today. I mean, just a cursory, you know, 10 seconds in the, the, the dev tooling in either Edge or Chrome, I mean, is going to yield a lot of really helpful information. A lot of it is, I mean, it, so much of it is done for you that you don't even have to infer what to do next. You can profile your site. It tells you specifically, you know, what types of optimizations you can make to get uh, what types of improvements. Um, but, yeah, the, the, there's just a lot of stuff on the web in general that, that slows us down. I mean, it's, uh, New York Times, I think it was, found that up to half of the information on websites is ads and trackers, uh, which is pretty crazy. So, I mean, we're obviously trying to find ways to uh, to reduce that, to fix it. In Brave, we just cut them all off, which is great. It makes the web fast and, and fluid, um, but it doesn't add much to the sustainability of the web, which is what we're working on right now. But as far as just the, the principle of, uh, of developing a quick and responsive web, uh, there's a lot of great tooling out there. And if it's insufficient, I would definitely love to know what specifically could be improved upon. So I can uh, chime in here. I'll admit I planted that question. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that came, basically, I guess, where I was coming from is that, yes, we have tooling, but that's one strategy. It's one approach to do things. And now there is, we're putting the burden on these individual developers. Like, and, you know, there's all these, uh, like, there's tons of developers that's kind of cycle through projects and features come and go. Um, how can we have, like, I guess, guarantees of user experience over time? Like, are we expecting every single developer to kind of, you know, pop up in their dev tools? And it's so easy to undo the work of, you know, all the work that's already been done. Well, I, I think we have a, a multi-layered problem, too. So uh, as I stated before, I work on the, the Angular team. And I know that uh, I, I did React development before that. And there's a lot of the uh, frameworks. They have these what, what are commonly referred to as CLI tools. Um, and nowadays, when you're developing apps, it's very common to have to use things like uh, Webpack or Bazel or whatever. And, and there's all of this tooling on the development time end of things to try to to help you reduce size and it's I don't think it's definitely not perfect it's it's they're, they're getting better um, but there's probably room for um, both ends of this to kind of come together a little bit uh, a little bit more efficiently and, and try to have things like dev tools work more in unison with the build tooling that everybody's using to, to uh, use frameworks or whatever to build all of these apps 
So I don't know what that would look like, but I definitely see that there's there seems to be a gap, and especially I think for outsiders, um, it seems like there's even within Google there's the Angular people, and then there's the Chrome pe people, and there's some sort of weird wall in between this, those two groups, and that's that's not entirely true. Um, but I do think there's room to grow uh, together from from those aspects because performance. Um, nowadays oftentimes starts in on the developer's machine and not not so much like because the browser made it fast some some magical way i think one of the things that uh you know, I take for granted because I started doing web development when there were amazing CLIs, and I was like, oh, I don't need to learn anything. I could just spin this up and build a website right now. And, uh, you know, then I talk to my friends, and they're like, yeah, you have it easy. But <laughs> I think when it comes to performance, it's, it's kind of like the same thing, I think, where we see with uh, progressive web apps right now, right? Or like uh, the Preact CLI basically, uh, meet, you know, doing everything to get you, like, have perfect whatever. I don't know, it's like Lighthouse. It optimizes, yeah, it basically optimizes you for everything. But I think it would be so amazing uh, in the next few years since performance is such a thing to enable developers by just saying like, hey, here's this tool that's going to do it all for you. It's going to measure all your stuff. It's going to tell you what to do. And then there you go, done. So I'm looking forward to that future. <laughs> So uh, one of the features of WebHint right now, when you run your website and it tells you what's wrong with it, um, it also links to a bunch of documentation that tells you what you need to fix, why you need to fix it, and how you can go about doing that. So it's really great because we're trying to teach developers also. And just a side plug, WebHint is completely pluggable. All the tests, like Lighthouse is a thing you run. WebHint are individual tests, almost like a ES Hint or any of the other hints that exist. So you can write your own custom thing if you want to make sure that a feature exists that doesn't really make sense to add upstream. But we definitely accept upstream stuff. Um, to piggyback off of something that you said, though, I, I think that when it comes to the expectations of individual developers over time, I think things like performance budgets or uh, feature policy, I think, is another wonderful thing where you can sort of, at an executive or very important person level, sort of set these rules where you are like, you cannot do this, and if you do, it breaks. Uh, CSP is another great example of this. These are rules where we can kind of set, and we have to be broken. You know, things just break if you go beyond it, and that's, for me, from my point of view, the things that have been the most successful in working with large teams. Yeah, just just that um, the the point of like what what Chrome is really well is the uh, creating enough material that as an engineer you can sell performance within your company. Like there's sh showcases, there's numbers, percentages, while second accounts and more ad revenue. So all these like help you to make a case as a developer within your company that you can actually work on this. Otherwise, most companies I visit and talk about performance, it's like one one person that holds up their hands like I work on performance and I run web page tests occasionally, then I bring data back to my team. Like that's that's not the way you fix performance has to be you have to bring in the constraints within project development you have to move slower you have to like work on quality it's just like anything in dev tools as well firefox dev tools we rewrote uh three panels in, in react and we lost a lot of polish that was acquired over the years in performance and we had to go back and like work on performance and make them fast again now they're they're back to their previous speed but it took a few releases just pushing for performance and building up the knowledge again like how do we profile react how do we profile that you have to understand react the that's what this brings us to tooling where like tooling is, is now in a great shape but it's also at a really high bar like a lot of people look at do like a dear Paul Paul Ivy show or the Alex Russell like this page is slow and then they look at profile and they're like wow so many bars the colors so what is what does green mean what does orange mean this is all yellow I don't know so it's just like you have to build up like through your organization awareness making priority learning the tools it just takes takes us extra time and more people I think that the but this is also I, I just wanted to say like when you have like all these different like frameworks and, and you build in you're building abstraction on top of the platform and I see a lot I talk to a lot of developers they don't understand these abstractions it's just magic of course it's like Tracy said it's creative things so it's just like magically fast by default and it's cool 
But when they're not and actually need to improve it, you kind of need to understand what's going on. Uh, and that's why I think it's great when we work on the web that we're trying to like remove the need for some of like all these framework things to sort of frameworks can become smaller. So there's things going on, for instance, people who worked on the web components are now looking at a template instantiation. So some of these things can be brought into the browser. Uh, so you remove some of this magic. Uh, but I think it's a big challenge to really understand like how the browser work. And every time you just add like new frameworks and things on top, it becomes harder and harder. It, it seems like very easy in the beginning, but then when you need to dig deeper, it's really difficult. It's an unsolved problem, but I think all everybody at this table is dedicating a lot of effort into it. We have multiple engineers working on WebHint at Microsoft. We have Google has a huge performance team. Uh, Firefox absolutely cares. I mean, everybody here cares a lot about it, and it's just one of those things where let us know what's hard, and we'll try and make it even better for you, and we'll invest. Everybody wants a faster web. One thing I haven't heard enough about, like I know both Harold and Patrick touched on this topic of incentive. Like what would it take like and you mentioned amp earlier right and so like seo and incentives can sometimes um, just make the right thing happen how could we get that in more places i think the the ecosystem is currently missing two things and the first of them is a strong performance culture in businesses like if your stakeholders don't understand the value of performance and how to tie those back to the business metrics they care about why would they approve the engineering team focusing on optimization so i think but there's still work to do there. The other thing we need to do is try to get, as Patrick mentioned, um, more people uh, enforcing performance budgets for their tooling so they don't regress. Um, a common pattern that we keep seeing with sites is that you know they'll they'll do a sprint to improve their performance, they'll get some good press out of it, and then we come back a month later and everything is heavily regressed because they've moved on to working on features. PMs don't have a good way to measure the cost of each edition that they're pitching for the product. And so as, as much as like, you know, uh, tooling, Lighthouse, WebHint, uh, as much of all these things have gotten better over time, uh, there's still a lot that we need to do uh, in the ecosystem to get people to understand um, the value of perf, when they're regressing, and to the extent that framework CLIs can also help us get there, uh, I think there is still some work to do. Uh, I should also mention uh, we were talking about maybe folks online have opinions about this stuff. So if we do get more questions about that, we'll uh, pick up on them after the break. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we've been talking about um, performance a little bit. Alex is a person that has strong opinions, I've heard, <laughs> <laughs> about this. Um, before we, we you know, uh, take a break, Alex, do you have any, any comments on this? I think we've identified the, the heart of the challenge here, which is uh, causing people to care, right? We've identified that we've got better tools than we've ever had before, um, and I can I can vouch for that and, and more. Um, and yet, uh, we are we are making choices collectively that are preventing us from succeeding on the most prevalent computing devices in the world. Um, it is not possible to take the default tool chain that a startup will use today and succeed on a $100 Android device. Doesn't work, can't work, you won't work. Um, so the distance between those is attention and sustained attention, and that means motivation. And so uh, we've spent a bunch of time on the Chrome team struggling with this problem, thinking hard about it, and trying to figure out like, how to cause people to care. Um, in ways that are comparable, that allow people to make comparisons across their choices and their competitors' choices, across their choices and their next set of choices. Um, th these are hard problems. They're, they're all metric-driven problems. They're very complex and deep as a result. Um, but the, the TLDR, I think, so far has been we need simple numbers that connect the levers that decision makers can pull with the levers that engineers can pull. Um, and those, that's, that can't be many numbers. It has to be one or two numbers. Those numbers have to be situated in a particularly reproducible way. Uh, they have to be meaningful and impactful. We have to be able to demonstrate their impact over and over and over again. They have to be re reproducible. Um, and so we have to be able to create a common language between decision makers 
bankers to say, if you move this number for your business, it will move your business in the direction that you want it to go. Um, and so my hope is that first input delay as a run metric uh, combined with time to interactive as a bench metric uh, represent our best understanding today of how to cause change in the tools and artifacts that our, our, tool, our long tool chains, our ever-growing tool chains produce, uh, such that we care, start to care about the right things. Um, and making, making that a business question, turning that into something that business decision makers value uh, is an open question. So I would love to hear, maybe after the break, how we can think about um, making those connections in a better, better way. We're going to take a break now for 10 to 15 minutes, and when we're back, we're going to take some uh, online questions related to this topic and others. So catch you all in 15.
Okay, sounds good. We good? All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are going to continue on our topic about performance, and we're going to jump to some online questions with Jay Phelps. Hey, everyone. So I actually don't have any questions around performance. The, the, the questions that I actually received so far are all around features, actually. Pretty much most of them are just can be summed as, when is this uh, particular feature coming? Um, things like off-screen canvas, uh, Heath and, and uh, the high efficiency image format, um, things like that. So I kind of, I think we don't have to touch on all of them. We can touch on some of them, but I think generally speaking, what is the best place for people to find out the answers to these things? Is there a single place that's canonical for all the browsers? I know there's like, there's, um, can I use this? MDN has um, on some of the articles um, a list of supporting ones. Um, and then there's Chrome Status, which um, last time I looked at least had a list of all the browsers as well, links to different issue tickets and stuff. What, what's the what's the best resource these days? Is any of these automatically updated and synced? Like, is there has there been a community effort for this yet? I think the effort has been tried to sync them up. Like, at least on platform status, I'm parsing JSON from all the others. Uh, but other than that, um, it's definitely right now makes like check all all the sites to answer to get each each answer. Um, but it, I think over, like there's definitely I think that's where room improvement like find like one platform. But even if we have trouble updating platform status right now. That's going through the MDN team right now. When the release comes up, they they make sure everything is there. But especially when things are outside of our peripherals, like things they're not focusing on, they're just not reflected uh, properly right now. So that, that's something we're ongoing with figuring out how far how detailed should we get there. Like it's something that we're not interested in at the moment. Should we list it? So that's the backup repo standards positions where. Basically, anybody that comes in like doesn't find our position on something. They they would like post it there, and we'll uh, we'll post our thoughts about it, <laughs> and then at least you know mm -hmm. where we're at. But other than that, it, it's definitely um, because there's just so many things happening uh, that's that's hard to track. But uh, well, do you, do you think, think it's, it's realistic to expect the browsers to be able to come together and create a single pla a single place where we can get the updated status or is that just not real, not a realistic goal? We're prototyping with standards positions. It's a uh, it's still in a pilot phase, but maybe something that comes out as like a public GitHub repo where people chime in might be something that's of interest. But Patrick, uh, oh no, right, please, I've talked too much, David. Oh, I, like I was just gonna say that if what you want to know is when is a certain feature going to be ready, if if somebody's trying to answer that question and like most of the code for that feature hasn't already landed in that browser, the answer they give you probably isn't worth much because priorities change. So like if it's not, mo if it's not half done, who knows if they can predict when it's going to be ready even if they work on that browser. Uh, to answer the most recent question of is it reasonable um, to expect a well, canonical source, there was a conversation at the most recent TPAC, um, which is a event where all the standards folks get together to discuss standards -y things in person as opposed to over email, so we get a year's worth of work done in a week. Uh, well, try to. Um, and there was actually going to be a effort in trying to get a, a schema defined so that all the very, like every single web browser now has a status page the idea being if we had a standard schema all browsers could suck up the other scheme uh, json updates and make sure that we're all in sync 
Um, it hasn't occurred fully yet. It's not the highest of priorities. Most of those are passion projects, but hopefully uh, soon, the more uh, traffic we see on those websites, the more uh, um, resources get put to them. Uh, I wanted to make a shout out though to one of the Firefox uh, members, the Dietrich, I believe is his name. He has the intent to ship Twitter handle. Uh, it's spelled out just like that. And it's not something that you could go to to directly look for an individual feature, but it will update you whenever any browser updates uh, a shipping feature or an intent to ship a feature. It's it's not super high bandwidth. It's maybe one or two updates every couple of days. So it's if you just kind of been to be in the know as far as how things are moving, it's a great Twitter account to follow. One of my favorites. I know some effort has been done in this uh, area as well. Like Edge has their status page, pulls in the Chrome status as well to give you kind of a, a dual perspective as to where features are in those two, two browsers in particular. But definitely would love to see more of that in the future. A comment scheme would be awesome. And I think definitely more work can be done to kind of do the automated uh, part of that because I know, as one of you mentions, because on the Chrome status page right now, it's sort of like a guideline. I'll make sure you keep this updated even after it ships or lands or something like that. So it's very much a manual process there. Uh, at least on the standard side, we're, we're starting to make that slightly more automated or at least push that down to the documentation level. Uh, hopefully MDN is is a pretty good source for that because we have um, an issue label on, on the WhatWug uh, repositories called, I think, needs documentation or effects documentation or something like that, um, which is for the MBN folks to pick up and and hopefully you know narrow the gap between uh, the MBN documentation and compatibility support and where the feature lands uh, in the standard and stuff like that. One of the things, I, I, I'm a member of the board for the MDN, uh, and one of the uh, things that we're currently looking into is leveraging web platform tests, something Martin may be able to speak about from Agalia, since I believe they're involved with the web platform tests to a certain extent, um, where the idea being it's sort of this gigantic test suite that tests all the features in the web browser and theoretically automatically pulling out uh, browser compat data from that, but maybe we could explain a web platform test a little bit and why it's a cool project. So I, uh, there was one question that came up about um, WebSocket performance in Chrome, and um, it's 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 not clear specifically what sort of data they're sending and what they're doing with that data. But um, one of the listeners right now said that they have an application that they're um, doing high performance, pushing a lot of data through um, a WebSocket, and they they're noticing that Chrome performance is much slower than other browsers for the WebSocket. Is that something that any of you Chrome folks have noticed before, and and it's on your radar? Um, I haven't. Um, when I did lots of WebSocket stuff, I didn't notice that. Just as a general rule, um, if you'd like to get a browser engineer out of bed in the morning, uh, give them a benchmark. Uh, give them a number to drive down. So please frame your question in the form of a benchmark, and we'll get to it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted okay. to get back to Martin on the web platform test real quick, just to see if there's further detail you wanted to dive into. Um, yeah, actually. Um... I can talk a little bit about the web platform tests. Um, there are, for people who work on many different browsers, they're a huge help because they establish this baseline in an area that there wasn't before. And I think that, um, that especially when we start talking about browsers that are not just the main browsers that people think about, but also the browsers that you run in your TV or in your refrigerator. Um, the, the web platform tests really help pull up these platforms as well. And um, I think that additionally, they're a really good way to, to get involved uh, working on the web platform from the outside. So I, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there as far as measuring compatibility and also opening up the, the process to uh, web developers. Like if a web developer was interested that it's listening right now, is how would they go about learning more about it? 
And it's also worth mentioning uh, perhaps the slightly unknown WPT.FYI, which kind of um, shows, you know, a latest, I think it's, I don't know, daily or, or a couple times a day or something like that, runs all the web platform tests against um, at least at least dev, I think, stable versions of all the browsers, so the, at least the main four, uh, and shows kind of like which ones are passing which ones are failing. So if you're really interested in whether something's working or not and you don't have the time to test it in a bunch of different browsers, you can go there and check that out. Um, that uh, could probably be publicized more, but yeah. Did we cover what web platform tests is? I think it, it might be worth mentioning that um, historically, browser projects have consisted mostly of tests. So Gecko and WebKit and Blink, the, all the engine projects have their own very large test suites to cover as much of the web platform surface area as they could possibly imagine. But those tests were not shared, so it meant that um, there was not a common agreement about what it meant to pass a test. And so web platform tests have been an effort led by Mozilla um, and, and with enthusiastic support of other browser vendors now uh, to come up with a unified set of these tests that we can all share. They're maintained, they're still are maintained per uh, engine tests because we can't test everything through a platform tests yet, um, but it has been a huge way um, to improve the uh, interoperability and compatibility of uh, modern engines. And I believe there's been commitments from all major browsers now to add web platforms tests for new features that are added. So it's a great way to both learn about new web platform features if you want to figure out how a lesser documented feature is used. Um, it's also a really good way to cause noise if there is something like that WebSocket performance issue, uh, getting a performance benchmark inside of something like web platform test is possible. It's worth starting that conversation at the very least. It's that's something to call but, it. Um, as a, as a way it's also yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. It's also it's great uh, for de de developers because, like, uh, for developer before, like, browsers have different APIs and different API surfaces. But uh, I think, like, one of the main challenges that have been as a web developer before is that some of these APIs they had different behavior. So I think that now that we have like a unified set of tests. Uh, we can kind of like when the browser has this, you can feature check for a feature. If it exists, it will at least like behave the same. And I think that's a major step forward. Um, what is also great is that you can just find the test there online and you can look at how they're built and you can create your own. So if you run into an issue, a, bu a bug, you can isolate, you can create like an isolated uh, test case and you can actually submit it. Uh. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, really, it's really, really hard to, um, to, uh, to to explain just how great, as a browser developer, receiving a minimized test case is. And a minimized test case means that everything that's not involved in that test case has been stripped away. So it's good to receive a bug report with a, a reproduction, but it's even better to receive just the bare minimum, because that makes fixing a problem in a browser take much, much less time. So if you find an issue with a browser, creating a minimized test case, and then even better, creating a minimized test case that fits into these web platform tests. I mean, that that can go a really long way toward getting your problem fixed. Yeah, uh, to a second, that's actually what I wanted to say. <laughs> so it is perfect. Um, so it's, it's really that that's the way browsers communicate about web content issues, and that's how if, if, if developers spend the time identifying an issue, boiling it down to the essential pieces and then uh, getting into a browser, that that's the way you can have it fixed as fast as possible. And that's the way it can be shared with other browsers. It will be in a repository of web platform tests and it will not break in the future. <laughs> so. Just a quick plug for something that a teammate of mine, Greg Whitworth, uh, whipped up a little while ago with the support of some other folks was uh, hashtag edgebug on Twitter. If you uh, tweet that out with a link, it will automatically create a bug inside of Edge's uh, internal bug database, and a lot of the times we'll end up reducing those over into web platform tests uh, if they're not already fully reduced. If there's something that you find that's an interoper interoperability issue uh, that you don't have the ability to upstream a test to web platform test or you want to learn how to do it, just add that hashtag and uh, me or my teammates will be thrilled to help you figure that out. Well, now, first off, now we know how to spam you. <laughs> but second off, I think, uh, don't you know, uh, as everybody was saying about uh, creating uh, creating different use cases and things like that, you know, uh, you have to think about, like, people who are maintaining this and the fact that 
you know, sometimes you're going to scroll through all the things that are the easiest. So if you give somebody a really easy problem to solve or in a way that they can just like pound it out immediately and spend five, five, 10 minutes on it, it's going to be much better because they're not going to like, if they just see a wall of text, they're just going to be like, Oh my God, I can't. And just <laughs> move on to the next thing. Right. So don't, uh, don't underestimate that if you actually want your problem solved. Yeah, it gives a really good place for uh, browser engineers uh, to start debugging and, and get a minimal example and start picking that up. We had a, a recent example of that with um, so the service workers in Chrome. Basically, if a request passes through a service worker, uh, the prioritization information from that request is lost. And so we actually had uh, some really awesome people in the community kind of create a minimal example of this, and uh, I was able to start looking in and debugging it and then also start preparing for school, so I haven't had too much time. But, um, but yeah, so just keep that in mind. And I know we haven't actually um, talked, I think, about where Web Platform tests are located, though it's probably relatively easy to find on Google, but just github.com slash web hyphen platform hyphen tests. Uh, they have a, a repo called WPT. Um, check that out. Contribute to it. Uh, yeah, that's it. I'd, I'd just like to point out that all the advice about uh, how to file a, a minimal, like a, a bug with a minimal reproduction, that, that applies universally across all open uh, programming projects. So not just for browsers, for, for everybody, yeah. And, and the closed ones, yeah. And at your work, uh, everywhere, pretty much. Yeah, the, the, the extra plug for filing bugs, so like a, a non bug filing system where you just like ping somebody, hey, something's broken, please help me. There's also uh, webcompet.org.com, uh, I'm blanking now, but basically like a, that's, that's front of Firefox and it's non-browser specific, so you can file if you see a webcompet issue on a, on a site and test it in two browsers and it looks different, it behaves different, then you can go to its site, uh, we'll file issues, we'll follow up with the site owners, we'll follow up with browsers to file issues. So there's a whole curation system behind and a team that helps investigation. So that's that's the like the hand holding system of filing bugs. So but if you have the time, um, then you can also file the other bugs where uh, any other questions from the online commenters, Jay? Yeah, so, so uh, some of them are very specific, specific like, like example. One of them is is about um, a four gigabyte limit in Chrome, and and then more generally being able to just detect whether you're reaching your memory limit or not, um, like those sorts of things. Does anyone have thoughts on that? I mean, Chrome specifically for the four gig limit. I don't know if other browsers have that as well. Um, but um, then there's also just having more insight into the current memory usage, programmatically that is. Yeah, sure, I can speak to that. Um, we've had a lot of discussion on this performance memory APIs in the last uh, year or so. Um, where we are with, with that right now is um, we made some improvements to the existing window.performance. Um, it was window.performance.memory okay? that gives you like another JS heap size and so forth. Um, so that's been kind of improved um, for the cases where when your site is you get like much more precise information now. Uh, and there was just an intent that went out, like I think a couple of days ago from Eric Chen about kind of making that an independent API. Um, the other thing that has been, has had a bunch of discussion is this thing called a memory pressure API. Uh, and that hasn't gone too far because of like, Couple, number of reasons, um, like the first of them being just sort of incentive. Like there have, um, so for example, there is a memory pressure API on Android, and uh, I believe very few developers use it. So, so lifecycle API is actually another approach to this problem, where we are sort of like creating this incentive by taking action, right? Like we will take down um, like very bloaty vendors and so forth. Uh, so there's been some discussion around having like a memory pressure in that context so, so that there is some kind of incentive structure to, to make that worthwhile. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting that we're doing maybe a less than seller job of reporting back to developers when they hit out of memory errors or crashes are caused. So um, there has been the proposal for, and I know that we've got work going on a reporting API, uh, the reporting observer. It shipped. It, it shipped, great. Uh, <laughs> amazing, love that. Yeah, did I LGTM that? Great. Um, and 
and uh, this is a generic framework for giving sites uh, a location that they can give us to send a report when something happens, um, and that something could be any number of events in the in the system, uh, but it could potentially include things like an out of memory error, and so that's one one um, potential future here. Another uh, important note is that the four gigabyte memory limit is a per renderer, um, and it may not be clear that all of the instances of tabs for the same site are going to appear in the same renderer process in Chrome today. And so there's some conversation here to be had about whether or not we should give developers a hint to say, please isolate this document from other documents in the same domain uh, to ensure that they get their own four gigabyte heaps uh, or whatever we decide the heap size should be. So that's a that's an ongoing conversation and I think um, conversations around uh, shared array buffers and re-enabling them in other browsers that don't have site isolation uh, may lead to a place where we have a flag uh, uh, in the platform that will enable us to express that developer intent. Cool. Does so anyone have any thoughts, thoughts on, on another question was around the uh, touch screen on screen keyboards, most mobile devices, you know, they have that on screen touch keyboard. There's not a lot of insight into whether that's showing when it shows what it looks like, what sort of controls you can do. There's some stuff like with input tag, you can in different types and stuff It will, it may or may not show, you know, a customized UI for tiling numbers or whatever. But Someone was asking more generally, is there have ever been talk about giving more control to the web developer around that? Yes, and I know that this is a specific pain point um, with regards to iOS. <laughs> um, our conversations with developers uh, yielded a bunch of fixes about a year ago with regards to our behavior when we report events, when we provide resize events, when we provide scrolling events and, and viewport um, change notifications. Uh, we hope that those are making life better for Chromium uh, developer developers targeting Chromium browsers on Android. Um, this is a persistent problem, however, with iOS. We've sent a few patches uh, up to WebKit and those have languished thus far. So please go lobby your friends uh, and colleagues at Apple. So a couple other things. These are just features that people were asking about. If anyone wants to touch on them, things like off-screen canvas, um, Shadow DOM, uh, Shadow DOM tracking um, with HTML form participation AP API, which that one I know about, but I haven't looked at, so I'm not sure what that is. Uh, and then the ability to customize scroll bars. We still don't have a standardized way of doing that, unfortunately. Um, did anyone, anyone latch on to any of those particular questions? And, and um, they're, they're basically just asking about when those type of features are available, but if anyone has any thoughts about them. I think not so, particularly. Uh, I think scroll bars will kind of go part and parcel with a lot of the form input stuff that we discussed before. There's some fundamental pieces that we all have to agree upon, and once we figure out sort of a language for describing how in like widgets inside of the browser look, you'll probably see work towards that. I know it's something that everybody wants to exist. It's just whether or not we can find the you know place in the priority queue to make sure it happens as soon as possible. Uh, with other features like off-screen canvas. Uh, and I'm sorry I missed the second one on that list, but um, at least as far as Edge is concerned, pretty much everything is an inevitable feature. Um, there's few things that we are actively really against. It's just whether or not it, we're going to be able to ship it, you know, on our next release or you know, in the release that my kid ships after he replaces me at the company. Um, <laughs> it's 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 you know, priority stacking and everything. And the best thing users can do and developers can do specifically is uh, talk about these issues much a lot, show off how great it is. And start using them in a responsible manner. Uh, you know, don't load giant polyfills and don't have broken experiences for non-supported uh, browsers. But if you can support features early and often, uh, we all web browsers track web use, uh, web API usages. You know, Microsoft certainly does. Uh, Google does as well, and we can see how many percent, what percentage of the web is using a API. And if a lot of people are using it, a lot more uh, resources are going to get thrown at a problem. You, you actually, actually touched. touched on something, something that would be really interesting to talk about, which is polyfills. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, I've seen several cases where the standard bodies had to go in a different direction because of polyfills, because of too eager or incorrectly implemented, but then uh, broadly adopted polyfills. Um, has there been thought about how 
like ways that people like we can have we can implement a polyfill but somehow it's protected and future proofed in a way that you know like I, I, i've heard some thoughts about this but nothing concrete in the industry about how we can have our cake and eat it too with the whole polyfill thing but not screwing ourselves during the standards process um this is a I, ecosystem I, level thing mm -hmm. sorry um go ahead no i would just, just say, say that, that with with native APIs, it also helps because suddenly you start like Im importing these APIs. So the problem with adding a new API to the, the core of the platform is that it will be available everywhere. You don't need to import anything for it to be available. And and that could then conflict with uh, with your own code or with polyfills that you're loading. But with approach like with layered APIs where some of these higher level APIs become like its own separate module, uh, that will make that like occur less. Group, the tag, um, uh, which is a group that uh, I've served on with David and um, Kenneth uh, and uh, Jan, who was meant to be here today and unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, last year, published a, what we call a finding, which is basically um, we spent a bunch of hours locked in a conference room somewhere in the world, and we uh, we had a bunch of people say, this is a really important problem. Please tell us what to do. And so we created a document that provides broad guidance about how to think about sort of uh, polyfills as, as things that are polyfilling stuff that exists and when something is actually speculative. And so it, it goes into some depth discussing the difference between speculative um, pre, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what to call something that isn't yet uh, fully, yeah, a probably fill something that isn't yet fully um, baked into the, into the ecosystem versus something that is um, just pulling up the rear of the train. And so uh, you can find that if you search for W3C tag and polyfills, uh, but the document title is polyfills in the evolution of the web. Um, that might be the, the most uh, complete uh, discussion of this that I, that I know. Um, at a practical level, I would suggest trying to load polyfills in a conditional way and do it from services that, that hew to these guidelines. So polyfill.io is something that I would like for you to you know, give a look to if you're, if you're trying to polyfill um, for your site. It's built by the and, and run by the Financial Times um, and hosted at Fastly. And it is a great service because it differentially and conditionally serves polyfills. You can say, I need these features, and it'll only give you the ones you don't have. And so this is a responsible way of making sure that um, you serve it well. But also, uh, they don't list things that aren't in this sort of actually polyfilling bucket. So if it isn't on polyfill.io, it probably isn't something you should be using. I'd just like to double up on Polyfill.io. It's a phenomenal free service. It's completely not, you, there's no reason not to use it. It's amazing. You can specifically opt into the only features you care about. And if it's in a completely modern browser and you don't need those features, you get a empty file effectively. And on older browsers, you get the smallest file possible. It's a really, really phenomenal resource that everyone should be utilizing if you're shipping a production website today. And I have to say, as the brave guy, uh, <laughs> that's a third party. So if you can handle that stuff first party, that's always a lot better. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, responsible testing before you try to make any implementations goes a long way. I think the news part is here with the polyfill issue that it affects not just standards, but it goes across the pipeline. Like those great talks at Fluent, how third parties basically monkey patch prototypes and hack each other and break each other. So there's like great care into anything you include into your website that you have to review it. Like, and there's now tools by different, different people like that to show you which prototypes got changed and which functions got overwritten. Babel stepped back from including stage zero because of the same thing, because it's, it's hard to, those specs still have to change. And you know, like if you suddenly break your code and it goes wild and you, you don't want to ingrain that into the web that you edit some f f first party thing and so I, I worked on MooTools and so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Actually, one thing that might, David might be able to chat about a little bit is th this is kind of what prefixes were supposed to originally be in CSS. It was this idea that we could ship a feature before it's finished and people could try it out and then obviously they would update their code to the latest version, but that didn't quite work out. I mean, I don't know how much there is to say about that other than that we do now know that that didn't work out and it probably was mostly predictable. Um, but. Yeah, we we've learned that that you know sh shipping feature that when browsers sh are shipping features, we're gonna 
hold off on shipping the feature until we're confident that we can use the name that that the feature has and confident enough that we think it's not going to change too much. Um, and then once we ship the feature, we're stuck with many aspects of it, depending on how widely it's get, it gets used. Just please update your code if you're going to use early features. Is the only thing. Uh, the reason why like Smoochgate and like CSS ver uh, sorry CSS prefixes and stuff were a problem were because people would ship modern features, which is great, and then they would never update their code again, and people rely on those sites. So play with new stuff, but be willing to update uh, frequently. And to my fellow browser vendors, uh, please implement something like origin trials so people can do that safely. Uh, relevant to this topic is one of our survey questions. So we asked developers, would you adopt new web technologies before they're implemented by all major browsers? And if not, why not? Um, I didn't want to go through all the responses, but some quick ones. Um, I would if the specs are finalized and other browsers won't end up implementing it differently. Uh, I would if polyfills or transpilation is an option. Um, many people said, I try them out in development, but I would avoid them in production so I know it's going to have good support in most of the browsers that my users are using. Um, there were also people that mentioned that polyfill performance in some browsers is a big concern for them. Um, they're, you know, they're fine with trying out new features, maybe including polyfills initially for uh, browsers that don't natively support the feature. How can we enable developers to use the new and shiny and give us feedback while also ensuring that experiences um, are not going to have a poor uh, sort of level of performance and poor experience uh, in browsers where native support is not? You should be treating polyfills the same way you treat any JavaScript code. You don't have to assume that it's terrible performance. You can test it, and if it turns out that it's terrible performance, you know that then don't use it. I mean, to this day, I think Lodash is faster than most of the native array methods, and that's just because John, uh, John David Dalton is a robot and is able to optimize code that no one else can. But you know, like you can have user land JavaScript that's faster than native JavaScript. Um, just test your code. Uh, you should. I'm pretty stalwart that you should absolutely be using a feature as soon as it's available in a single browser. I shipped a service worker the first time it was available in Chrome Canary. Um, I think that it's something that if you can help one user, that's great. Don't have experiences that depend on that. Uh, you know, don't build your entire feature to where it breaks if you don't have a cutting edge feature that only ships in Chrome. I, I weep every time I see a Chrome only website and I'm starting to run out of tears. Uh, it's you know, be a good web citizen. Make websites for the open web, but don't be afraid of modern features. That's how other web browsers know to implement these things. You know, Chrome has a lot of features that get added to the web. We don't have quite as few uh, engineers as they do, and so we can look to users and web developers to see that, hey, a lot of people are using this new technology. We should really be putting a lot of investment to make sure that it's as great as possible. You know, things like Web Components, WebP, and all these other places that we've been putting efforts recently. I think it's also, yeah, going back to the point I made in my presentation that the web doesn't need to be pixel perfect. Like you can, there's great talks by Jen Simmons and others talk about, you can adopt CSS grid, fall back to Flexbox, you don't have to, but that's, that's a, a mindset that's not broadly accepted across the website. So that's, that's something just so, if you have a test project, if you have like one side of, of your project can go into CSS grid and the other stone, that, that's we can at least try it out and try out these specs as early as possible so that that way you can actually give feedback and it doesn't have to be in production it can be like an internal system that only has have green browsers so there's many ways that you can jump on a bandwagon early and then you don't have to push code to production and uses it but if if it's progressive and you can make it progressive then please do not to mention the the web platform is kind of yielded a lot of helpful tools as, as well. We have things like CSS supports today, which makes a lot of this much, much easier. So it's it's gotten easier than ever before to good like do good feature detection, behavior detection before you implement this type of stuff and progressively enhance your experience up to that higher level. So. I want to make a pitch here for um, differential serving. Uh, I know that this is something that polyfill.io does uh, implicitly, and uh, it would get a bad name if it wasn't so so darned uh, critical right now. Um, 
people will call this UA detection, but it, but well done, it's not actually that. It's treating it's treating um, the user agent as an actual uh, hash, and so. The, the problem we face today and the, and the weird state of the world is that uh, the users who can most afford the polyfill load are also the ones with the oldest browsers, or the, the browsers that are furthest behind, should I say. Um, and so uh, it's the case that you can afford to send quite a lot more polyfill uh, overhead to users who are on fast n network networks and wired connections uh, on desktop class machines, whereas the users who are on um, mobile devices, uh, potentially on flaky networks, may have uh, engines that are much more up to date or, or may have more of the features that you would expect implemented. Uh, and so it's critical that when you use a polyfill, you ensure that you're only sending it to the set of users that can afford it. Um, the economics are in a weird spot. Rich users can have, rich users have bad browsers. Poor users have great browsers. Make sure that you're not taxing the poorer users the most. Poor people have. I'm saying that poor, poor uh, relatively less affluent users tend to have better browsers than the relatively more well-off. Um, and that is true on both desktop and mobile. And it's weird, but it's true. So don't, please, 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 for the health of the web and for the viability of the ecosystem, don't send polyfills to users with great browsers. So one theme I was hearing in the survey response was around like developers wanting that confidence that something is on a standards track. I'm not sure that we answered that question. Like, is there a, how would they know? I. MDN is an invaluable resource. Uh, if you go there, we try to track to see whether or not something is explicitly not on a standards track. There's not a lot of features that are getting made on the web today that aren't at least intended to be on a standards track, not necessarily that they'll be accepted at the standards level and implemented in other browsers. But I don't think that, I don't want to speak for other browsers, but I can tell you that Edge certainly has no intention of adding a new ActiveX control or anything like that to the web and never having it work anywhere else. You know, the, the browser wars are, are are over. We all try to work together as much as possible to make the web the best place as possible. Um, so just going to look up something and seeing it there, uh, generally speaking, if it is not an old browser, or sorry, not an old API and it doesn't involve the word WebKit or Chrome in its namespace, it's probably on the standards track. Um, there are some old stuff that is being standardized that specifically have the WebKit in its name because websites don't get updated. Um, you know, shout out to Mike Taylor's Compat team and everybody else on that, um, but uh, at, Mo uh, at Mozilla. But um, yeah, I think that uh, MDN is the invaluable resource to find out whether or not standard features are on a standards track. Any other questions, Jay? No, no not uh, not yet. Other than that, there was, there was a, some specific ones, like if we want, if we have the extra cycles, we can always talk about like some specific things, like um, someone's wondering when high efficiency image form, file format is going to be um, supported by browsers, uh, Heath, oh, those sorts of things. Uh, image codecs are never a technical issue. The technical problem is figuring out the codecs. The implementation detail is figuring out the licensing for codecs. So it's a, it's a money thing for lawyers. It's really, really boring and probably not good for me to talk about in public. But in general, as soon as possible. It's something we all want. Uh, that one specifically is heavily encumbered in the same way that H.265 is. So if AV1 is the open alternative to H.265, HEVC uh, will have um, similar encumbrance to H.265. And so you would be looking at um, WebP as the alternative, which is shipping uh, ever more broadly today. Shipping at Edge 18. Okay. There's a question about um, security. The um, one of the one of the persons asked. I don't think that there's any browser vendor currently alerting when the user has an extension that has been removed from the store. Um, it's not necessarily a question, but I think the question is just ultimately why not? Um, or has there has there been discussions around that? 
We have uh, recently, one example was when MetaMask was mistakenly removed from the Chrome Web Store and the imposter MetaMasks were left, <laughs> unfortunately, mm -hmm. and then that happened in the uh, Google Play Store as well. Um, but this is one of the, we're actually building something I Brave right now for this because we understand that as good a job as, as the Chrome Web Store team is doing, there's still uh, some cases that get missed. And so we actually host our own separate AWS instance with uh, the CRX downloads, the Chrome extension downloads. And uh, we're actually building in uh, profiling right now to watch these types of things when they change ownership. If there's a substantial change to the extension that might uh, be an evidence or an indication that a new bad actor has taken over an extension and has benefited from its previously good, squeaky, you know, squeaky clean reputation. Um, so it's not available yet, but it's something that we're actually actively developing. So Firefox runs with a add-on blacklist that gets updated and pulled every day. So add-ons uh, that, that have showed up um, to be security issues, they should be removed within a day. Uh, Edge has the good fortune of learning from the sins of Alpha others. Uh, Chrome and Firefox stores, we have a much more restricted uh, number of extensions that exist in our ecosystem, but we still maintain most of the extensions that get actively used uh, as a result because we've been so much more uh, pinned down and so much more uh, heavily audited when they get added to our store. We actually haven't had nearly as many uh, security issues as other browsers have just by their more open nature. Uh, that being said, um, users can have stuff removed by like group policy or other window stuff, and we do inform them that features have been removed from the browser when that happens. Cool, so we're, we're gonna hop on over to one of our other questions. Um, do you feel it could be easier to get started working on a new site or project? Do you feel your current tools serve you well? Uh, we had many respondents that said, you know, their current tools are serving you well, Create React app is great, front end has gotten use good old scripts in many cases instead of build steps um, felt that uh, hey Eddie your, your mic, mic is, is going to cut, cut out. out sorry there we go um, and then other folks, folks felt that uh, there we go all right uh, so I think the, the question to this group is that developer tooling has improved over time. You know, we've got uh, improvements over the last decade in Chrome DevTools, Edge DevTools, Firefox DevTools. Um, and on the framework CLI side of things, uh, they've been trying to strike the right balance for uh, ensuring low friction for the developer experience and user experience. Um, do browser vendors think that today's tools, libraries, and frameworks set developers up for success? And if not, what are the things that need to change? Think about developer experience a lot <laughs> in my job. That's definitely something um, I'm, I'm watching uh, from the outside. So I think there's a, I think a skewed understanding of how people use frameworks. Usually, the the, the hardest kid on block gets used. Like on pick React because that's that's used right now. Or, but there is a big uh, community outside around TypeScript, which usually gets because they're not as they're more enterprisey. They're not as she is loud. So people, uh, there's a strong fellowship there. So this. Uh, they're all, they're all kind of getting further away from the browsers, so which I talked about before, like the idea of DevTools being less useful the further you get away, like you use S S CSS for your CSS, so suddenly the, the styles you added in your editor within are not the same that you see within DevTools, so the human versus machine code gets gets more and more apart. And that's something I think um, with CSS Grid and moving more of the paradigms that people expect, like there's a great fellowship now, like people, uh, the maintainer of Suzy saying, like, you shouldn't use Suzy, you shouldn't use a, a grid framework, you should just use CSS grid, and she rewrote Suzy uh, within CSS grid, and that's just amazing examples of getting closer to the platform again, where you don't need to actually go away, you can use custom properties and grid and just build great layouts. And the same thing applies to um, frameworks where if you stand up correctly with source maps and everything, like you have a great job experience end to end because like the dev tools can put everything together again for you and you can work within the code. But I think overall, I see people struggle with the complexity of the web. That's just, just through tooling, through built build chains. It's 
getting hardy, like you focus on like your one tool chain. And if you talk to all the like, people who work on the web for a while, they're just, yeah, I'm using React, but I also built in other browsers before and I built in other frameworks. So like getting this open mindset of that you can switch tools, that you can learn other tools, you can switch between frameworks, you can write it vanilla because not everybody knows the framework. So I think that that's something um, that has to also happen within the community, that it's okay to use another framework, that you're not make, being made fun of for using Firefox within a like, Chrome team, right? So it's, it's that kind of mindset that, that there's you, you can pick your tools and you can explore and learn. Uh, the question is kind of interesting because it's sort of like, are people too healthy? Like, there's there's always going to be an effort to make websites faster, no matter what, no matter how fast they are today. If you were to give me today's websites when I was a child, I would be ecstatic at how amazingly fast they are. But um, there's definitely always work to be done here. Um, I think that the thing that browsers is, vendors can focus on explicitly are adding more and more of the fundamentals, the part of the extensible web uh, that was mentioned before, things like uh, offline web apps through service work. Workers, uh, thing, uh, things like web components, you know, and you can build on those better today with stuff like Stencil JS, where you're able to take a web component and move it over to other frameworks. You know, like that sort of an experience allows you to build these modern websites f faster today. And I, I, I don't know, I really, I really like it. It's, uh, I think that that's something that vendors are really focused on getting the fundamentals as right as possible and letting user land stuff like libraries be able to iterate faster and create more future like create the cow paths that the browsers can pave later on. So a quick pitch on ROM, which is real user measurement. Um, I guess I would encourage for developers to just answer that question for themselves. Like don't assume that your tools and your frameworks are, you know, just sort of setting you on the right track. Um, the only way to know for sure is to actually look at your production uh, performance numbers. So, and, then, and we have shipped APIs recently that help you answer that question. So, if you look at things like, you know, your first contentful paint and your FID and time to interactive, um, these metrics will tell you it, what kinds of experiences your users are having. I would I would uh, expand on that and say that I don't believe most developers today uh, quite know that there is a difference between the type of lab uh, view of your performance that tools like your developer tools uh, might report to you and field data, so RUM, um, that your real users are going to be experiencing. And it's critical to measure both of them. I know that you know we're, we're definitely doing a lot of work in the, the Lighthouse space in the PageSpeed Insights space to try making that a little bit easier using the Chrome User Experience Report. But in general, um, if folks can track those metrics in the field a little bit closer, I definitely, definitely think that would be good. I'd like to, you know, maybe dissent from Patrick's rosy view a little bit. Um, so I, I believe the evidence suggests with pretty high confidence that the web is currently in a crisis. Um, and that crisis can be characterized in, a, in several ways. You could start with the fact that desktop shipments ticked up for the first time, I think last quarter in five years, eight years, something like that. We are not on average creating more desktop class computers every year than we have in the past. So that is a, that is a waning um, market. Uh, at the same time, there has been explosive growth in the low end of the, specifically the Android, but the, the smartphone market. And so most new computers are a tenth the speed of most new desktop form factor computers. Most new computers are a tenth the speed of an iPhone X or an iPhone 8. Most new computers don't look anything like what you, if you can afford to be on this live stream, probably carry every day. They look more like one of these. This is a $100 uh, Android Go device, and it is a one gigabyte device, and boy howdy is it slow. And what that means is, practically speaking, the web may never reach these users. So computing is shifting. It has been for the last 10 years shifting to mobile, and the web has not followed along. And that is in part because uh, we have taken tools which were built and designed for the desktop era and deployed them in a mobile environment. And for the same reasons that Shuby and Addy are, are highlighting, um, we have an, a cultural blindness to the impact of applying desktop tools to the mobile environment. And I know that um, I, I know that Edge and Brave and Firefox all have mobile browsers, but uh, Chrome now has more users 
on mobile than it does on desktop um, by a, a fair few. Uh, and what that means is uh, these are the center of our user base. And let me tell you, um, today's mobile websites uh, don't work well on this device. And this device is has four or three more cores and three X as much memory as the computer that I had when I was a kid. And so th I can tell you today's mobile websites wouldn't work well. I wouldn't be happy for them on the devices that I had when I was a kid. And I don't think most of the end users that are compose our user base are having a good time on the web today. So uh, what we're doing isn't working. It isn't working for most of our potential user base. And over time, practically speaking, cumulatively, that means that we aren't going to be the ones doing the work for them. Some other platform will take over. It will be a generational shift, and it may be happening right now. And the web doesn't have to survive. Uh, it has been a great run if this is where we end. It has been an outstanding contribution to humanity that we have built this global repository of linkable, indexable understanding that we can all uh, generate knowledge from and learn from. But there is no, uh, there's no given future. We have to earn it. Um, and right now, let me tell you, um, we're not earning it. We're, we're strip mining. This is, uh, JavaScript is our CO2, and we are putting way too much of it into the ecosystem. So um, if you think that it's going well, uh, you aren't paying attention. I think that's kind of like, uh, you know, um, I've been traveling a lot, and I remember uh, going to India and uh, getting involved in the developer community there. And, you know, the first time I heard that no, no frameworks router works because it just can't because they need server-side rendering, I was like, wow, that's so amazing. And I think a lot of times, um, especially for those uh, sort of more Western developers, you don't get a lot of opportunity to see what it's like to live on lower speeds and like slower devices. So uh, when I travel and I'm limited to 2G, it's kind of amazing how less online I am because Instagram's not gonna load for me, like Twitter loads, but like not really. Yes, I'm sure I could use Twitter Lite, but <laughs> you know, there's all these things. And you know, I think like in that world when I'm traveling, I'm not really, I'm just not really as online as I would like to be because Nothing works. Like I told Addy the other day, I was like, Fashion Nova is not loading any pictures for me. Fix it. I'm glad you didn't try to, but you know, I couldn't online shop on the plane because nothing would load. So uh, I, I work on Angular. I work for a framework and at risk of no longer working for the framework. Um, I, I will say that it's something that at least the Angular team and I'm sure all the other uh, friends I have working on other frameworks right now are working very, very hard to make people successful by default. Uh, but part of the reason they're working so hard to make people successful by default is because right now we're not really. Like it's 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 uh, too easy for someone with very limited web development, development experience to be like, oh, I'm going to use a CL CLI tool, I'm going to start building this thing, and then they add 47 routes and all the code behind all 47 routes. They're not code splitting anything. Uh, maybe they're not, not using ahead of time compilation or whatever the, the framework provides, and they're shipping mountains of code. And then you, you end up uh, with Alex Russell coming and lighting your computer on fire. Um, but I don't actually do that. <laughs> well, we, we stopped you. You're not allowed. Um, so, but I, I think that uh, the state of things. I think what things... happened was your CPU was already so hot that you just confused me. <laughs> right, right. It was, it, there was four gigs of Chrome running at the time. So, um, <laughs> I used to work at Google. Um, any, anyhow, uh, I, I, I think that uh, they're all working towards that. But that's that's the this the silver lining is that. Uh, all of the frameworks, uh, particularly, I can at least speak for Angular, are well aware that this is a problem, and they're, they're trying their, their best and uh, focusing a lot of effort towards making Angular apps, in particular, very small. Uh, other frameworks are trying to do the same thing. I know there's, there's efforts with like Ember and, and uh, Vue, particularly with code splitting and things like that. Um, 
And it's going to be an ongoing process. Um, the other thing that I would tell people that are out there listening to this right now is is a few years ago, I went to go speak in China. I was, just, I was working at Netflix at the time, and I was talking about RxJS. And uh, I asked a question, and this might stun some American developers for sure, but I, the question I asked was, how many people here uh, develop for desktop only? And hardly anyone raised their hand. And I thought to myself, oh, okay, these people just don't like raising their hands. That's great. And then I asked how many people develop for mobile, and the entire room of more than a thousand people raised their hands. So that's that's the market that you're you're looking at, at growing into, and you you need to be you need to be aware of that. So what, the the stuff that Alex says, well. Um, Doom and gloom is is you know it's good because a lot of us just paint the rosy side of it uh, all the time. Uh, but the framework folks, we are we are working towards making that a, the world a better place as far as those concerns go. Uh, but it will take some time. I want to highlight some caution around thinking of this as being a geographic issue. This is a class issue. This isn't about whether or not you happen to be in Indonesia or India or China or Africa, somewhere in Africa, some places in Africa. This is about whether or not you make more than $4 a day or more than $8 a day or more than $100 a day or more than $500 a day. Um, as your income approaches $100,000, your propensity to carry an iPhone goes to one, right? Like the probability of carrying an iPhone is 100% at $100,000 or more a year in, in income. Um, and what that means is that in America, where <laughs> um, wages have been stagnant uh, and in real terms have been declining, uh, folks who get a phone for free from the phone company when they go and sign up for a plan, they get what you would consider to be an, a next billion user de class device for free with that plan. My my family carry those devices or have carried those devices and the web isn't working well for them either. So this isn't somewhere else. This is down the street. This is less money than you make, but it's not anywhere different than where you live. I think like Ben's point uh, that he brought up with the frameworks and sort of like I, I it's interesting because, you know, I think these are all things we should think about, but I also really love the fact that you can, as a beginner, just, you know, spin something up and do it and, you know, you can make something work and sure, it's not going to work for everything, but I, st I still remember this one website I built and I was like, yeah, put iframes. And then, you know, it had a ton of different iframes and it didn't really work out. And that was okay because I didn't know any better, but we fixed it. <laughs> so like, it's really cool because like, I think right now with the web, because learning JavaScript has gotten so much easier, people can just do stuff and it's awesome and you shouldn't be discouraged from doing that. But then at the same time, it's so cool because we're starting to create this education to say like, all right, you know, you finish uh, you know, college and now go to grad school and like these are the new things that you need to learn to optimize for the web. Yeah, Ben and I were having this conversation earlier at a break where there's a there's a class of tools that do set you up for success, which I think was part of your earlier question, which is, are we being set up for success? And I'd say most of the tools that people are reaching for, which are which are in this weird conversation, we have this discussion about which framework to choose. And I think that in the moment where you're deciding between frameworks, you've already lost the battle. Um, the battle was being set up for success, and making a choice about your view layer framework is literally the wrong choice to make. You should be making a choice about which which end-to-end -end system that's going to support me in deploying effectively everywhere, I'm choosing. That might involve a framework choice or a preference about framework in the context of that overall choice, but I will tell nobody to use Polymer. I'll tell everyone to use Polymer PWA Starter Kit. I will tell nobody to use Ionic. I'll say I use use the Ionic PWA Starter Kit. I won't tell anyone to use Angular. I'll say use Angular CLI with Ivy. Don't use Vue, use Vue with Vue CLI. Don't use Preact, use Preact with Preact CLI. Pick up something that's going to set you up. Um, basically, at the moment where you're sitting there deciding to write a Webpack config from scratch, you've lost, right? Like, you need something that's going to bake in differential compilation, route-based code splitting by default, something that's going to make sure that you're loading your polyfills effectively. These aren't optional. These aren't bolt-ons. They're super hard to retrofit into an infrastructure. You need to start with something that gives you that architecture and that backbone by default. And if you're making a new thing, these tools are super easy. Take Svelte, but don't take Svelte. Take Sapper, right? Take the thing that gives you the structure. Don't take the thing that comes with a, a construct your own toolkit unless there's no chance of you doing real damage with it, right? If it's a professional project, you can't afford to choose a framework. You have to choose a superstructure. 
I think the second um, also to, to how this this is usually the, the very strong focus on frameworks because that that's usually like the decision people have to make at the first round um, or within the team that always comes up where pe most people can contribute and you can bike shed and all these things. Uh, but looking at the, where people spend most of the time optimizing right now on the web, existing projects and new project, it's just sending bytes over over the wire. There's fonts, there's design system, there's third parties, there is like uh, it's the end when they finally like looked at performance because it, they found India has a really low connection rate and low, low engagement. They looked at because it, there was an image compression, there was of CDN issues. So it was a, found a whole slew of other problems. So I keep keeping an open mind like where, where it looks like keep profiling, keep looking at network traces. And if your framework eventually turns out to be a problem, you're in a pretty good spot otherwise. <laughs> I think one aspect of this discussion has been uh, friction, and especially for beginners, we're constantly trying to lower the friction for you being able to build something compelling really quickly, but with that comes the responsibility um, of our tooling to be baking in uh, best practices by default as much as possible, so that, to Tracy's point, it's still easy to build something, but to the extent that we can at least try to give you better guardrails so that you don't end up shipping something with five or six megs of JavaScript over the wire, we should be doing that. I feel like I feel like that's still something that we can um, we can noodle on. Um, I'm I'm constantly reminded by the experience that I've had with WordPress, where we trace WordPress sites all the time now, and we'll we'll commonly see that people are you know enabling 30, 40 different plugins. It's not uncommon to see 10 different versions of jQuery in those sites. Um, you know that's that's very similar to the experience people have uh, building single page apps now where you know it, it's very easy to npm install you know some random piece of ecosystem library code because it helps you build something really fast but you don't always understand that every piece you add to your app has got a cost and it does add up um, so there there is a lot of work we can still do in our framework tooling and our developer tooling to just highlight when you have problems and to the extent we can still keep it low friction enough for people to build, um, I'd be happy if we got some nice balance there. I did a, uh, some research in a talk a couple years ago uh, just talking about the change of the web over time. And I remember back in 96, 97 or so, I always aimed arbitrarily for about 50 kilobytes of data on my website. And I was like, if I can keep it around 50, I'm good. Uh, and then just a few years ago, I looked online, and it looks like the average website is in excess of, or actually web page, rather, is in excess of five megabytes these days. Probably quite a bit larger you know, today as well. You put one GIF on there, and you're, you're blowing away your, your 50 kilobyte uh, limit. But uh, coming back to the tooling as well, there, there's fantastic tooling. And I, I would encourage anyone that's listening to this to just drop into your browser's developer tool, uh, toolbar, not toolbar, but the dev tools. I was thinking of IE7 with the developer toolbar. <laughs> but the uh, the dev tools, there's network simulation speeds. You can slow things down. Um, you can experiment quite a bit. If you have a proxy, it might it might actually have throttling features. Uh, but definitely give that stuff a shot. It, it's low cost for you to find these tools and utilize them. Uh, and they oftentimes yield some really valuable insights that you otherwise wouldn't have noticed because maybe you are you know, more affluent. You have a, a much better device. You have serious connectivity. I know my iPhone has horrible connectivity. Uh, and I would love for the web to be much faster, much smaller. So uh, another thing I think uh, that people don't think about too, if, if they're uh, considering the, the uh, what Alex was saying with people having um, slower devices and slower connections, um, and then they look at their analytics and they might not see it, right? Because if someone's downloading a whole boatload of stuff and the Google Analytics code either never comes down or is never executed, they're never going to show up in your analytics. So, um, you know, you can't really trust that that's not really still your audience or your, because they're they're failing to see your site. So you still need to measure your your uh, bundles and and uh, your output, uh, assuming that maybe you're just not seeing those people. There, there was a phenomenal story actually from Google a number of years ago of the YouTube Feather rewrite where uh, it ultimately went into the up till the web component changed, the most recent version of YouTube, where there was a whole bunch of making YouTube as small as possible and they, to make it as fast as possible because clearly if we make it smaller, it'll be faster and everything will go. And then after several weeks or months of uh, 
metric uh, recording, I looked at the metrics and it turned out that the average page time for users had gone up. And it wasn't because most users actually experienced that. The median was lower. It was that so many people on the long tail end of the web that used to wait three hours to load a video on YouTube for a single video could now do it in like 15 minutes because you remove that. And to that point exactly, these people were completely not even on the metrics previously because they don't have three hours to wait waiting for something, you know, but they can, might be able to wait 10, 15 minutes. And those are the people that today are completely left behind that Alex mentioned. And those people aren't necessarily in Siberia. They could also be, you know, where my uh, mother-in-law lives. You know, they have zero cell connectivity. When I go through there, I no longer have websites unless they have a service worker. These are features for users right in your backyard that can absolutely be using these things. Um, and I really think to wrap everything up from an earlier point, adding things like uh, feature policy, CSP, these things that actually break your build. Uh, Addy was actually instrumental in adding Webpack performance budgets uh, way back in the day. Um, the, the, getting these features in, it's all about empathy and understanding that if you make your website smaller, faster, it's just going to make it better for everybody. Whatever you're trying to do, more people will have access to it. It's great. Get those things in early and make sure that you set rules that you do not change. You know, you don't keep bloating up your performance budget just because you want to add more code. And make sure that when somebody breaks that, it breaks a build. You don't ship that code if it's breaking your feature policy, if it's breaking your um, your performance budget, whatever those things are. You know, stick to those things and we will make the web a better place. Any any tool that uh, a browser could add that would allow um, developers, framework developers, to analyze what they're shipping is a big win. Uh, one of the things I, I talked with, I thought it was Alex, but it might have been Addy at some point, uh, was like right now people use things like um, I think it's called Bundle Analyzer or uh, sort Source Source Map Explorer. That's what I'm trying to think of. Uh, where it's not built into the browser, but it would be fantastic if it was. Uh, because frequently you're like, oh, why is this bundle so big? And the only way to know is to run it through some node-based tool that gives you kind of a visual out, like layout of, oh, 17K came from this import and 20K came from this import and so on. Um, so, I mean, as a framework developer and as a web developer, uh, if if I could st stress that any sort of analysis that uh, we get into things like that that everybody is shipping to to the web from uh, browsers and, and dev tools w is would be fantastic, uh, would be very helpful. I completely agree on that. I think that one one challenge that I I keep running into is we we use these terminologies like bundle analysis um, and you know source maps. The average web developer doesn't know what a bundle is and so they don't know what bundle analysis is they don't know that you know uh, installing a bunch of libraries requires them to even think about analyzing what that output that they're shipping over the wire actually contains and so they're they're not aware that sometimes they'll be shipping duplicate library code in there or code that they don't need uh, and so there there absolutely is value in us trying to bake in um, better analysis tooling into the browser uh, we've talked about potentially baking in something like a, a Webpack bundle analyzer or a source map explorer into something like Lighthouse. Um, I think there's still opportunities for us to do things like that. Uh, we do need to think about like what the UX of those types of experiences look like because just giving people a pretty visualization isn't enough, right? Like I can, it's, it's trivial to do that. We we need to also give them the tools to understand. Well, you know, yeah, if there's if there's a really big portion of this graph that uh, is bad here are the list of actions you need to take to address that and um, fix that problem. But definitely something we're interested in exploring. And I think beyond tools, uh, there's still like, it's, it's LX, there's still like the, the need for a buying loading device. Like every every project we do at Firefox now, but performance will start by ordering lots of loading devices. Like that, that's what we have to get in people's hand. And we got $250 notebooks that you would buy as a student and they're really popular and they're low end and they're they're fun to use. <laughs> you, you feel the pain. So in, that's their most efficient to profile. You can throttle your CPU along, but as soon as you, your browser hits IO, it's also there's uh, so many components in this computer that make your hard life, your, your life harder than like GPU and hard drive. So they're not within DevTools right now. Like there's no GPU throttling or IO throttling. So they're all uh, influenced that. So get a loan device, uh, get a second one to give to your next developer or have at least on the office. So there's uh, many ways and many, they're, they're cheap ways, so, but they, 
patent out because the tools you're using will actually work much better on those. Product managers, give product managers cheap phones. It's my, it's like my go-to move. Give product managers cheap phones. They're cheap. That's good. <laughs> but but yeah. the product manager is living with them and understanding the implications of developer choice. It's hard to convey any other way, right? The experience of it not scrolling when you put your finger down, the experience of it not loading when you tap on the icon, the experience of it um, just sort of sitting there and you go, wait, did I tap that? Did it? Oh, and then it comes in. Yeah. Um, that th There's no substitute. You know, those people care about performance, but there's types of laptops and phones next to our desk. So, I would also say, like, uh, for beginners listening to this, it's you know, it might seem intimidating, but the best way to, you know, start is to just learn one thing and then write about it uh, because that knowledge is really important and I would I think that everybody agrees like we could have better documentation about these things right so uh, in order to to help you be surprised how much of an impact just writing small little blog posts about like oh here's you know here's how I improve performance or here's what I learned about you know how to profile my website or here's this and um, these are things that most developers, I think, don't know. So again, as you're going and learning it, documenting it, contributing back to these websites that might have it, or just writing in your own blog posts and sharing it on Twitter uh, is, 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 a, is a really great way to have a true impact um, on the web. And not to discount the fact that browsers look at those blog posts. We know when blog posts make the round because they're useful, it's something that we do to make sure we either fix failings in the browser or we use them to inform how we're going to make things better in the going forward. So uh, on to one different topic. Uh, one of the things we asked was, what features do you think web browsers are missing? If there's a feature missing, what is your use case for browser vendors considering it? Uh, one that came up a few times was better ad blocking and tracking protections for users, which I mentioned since we have Samson in the room. Um, browsers should be protecting their users from invasive scripts or at least giving them better options for doing so. Um, I know this is a potentially contentious topic, but uh, I thought I'd open it up to the room for thoughts on this topic. What can we do better here? So Brave ships out of the box with ads and trackers, third-party ads and trackers. I need to specify that because that's typically what people have problems with, um, blocked entirely. And we're unapologetic about that because they've they've become something other than what they were originally designed to be. I mean, the whole web has. Back in the early 90s, we didn't have images, we didn't have cookies. All this kind of stuff just accidentally evolved into a very disastrous ecosystem that is tracking people around the web, um, even off of the web sometimes. You might go into a brick and mortar store, buy something with a credit card, and then get retargeted online for that. And, and so we we cut that stuff out entirely. And, and we actually envision a, a future web where that stuff is not going to be living on. There's a different way to achieve the same ends, to monetize the web, to get paid for the great content that you're producing. And that's what we're exploring right now with uh, Brave Ads and Brave Payments. Uh, turn it all on its head. Instead of doing uh, the matching out in third parties, as I was showing earlier in uh, some of the graphs, doing that matching locally on your machine so you're not emanating any data about yourself anywhere. Uh, everything stays encrypted by your device. It doesn't go to anybody. Um, that's what we would, we're doing that right now and we're trying to foster that communication to see if we can get other people to do that as well. So we got on the Firefox side in Firefox 63 now ready, there's a new new cotton plugin strategies so you can opt in. So we're not shipping with uh, default on, except that that's, yeah, the, the web would break for publishers and many others, uh, just like at a scale of a Firefox right now. So but there's, there's a few things we can do, like there's uh, methods like blocking trackers that take longer than five seconds to load. So anything that causes a, a bad experience, we can experiment with those. There's also new categories. So if you use Firefox Claw or Focus, uh, and then on your phone, you can actually opt in. I want to have on the block social trackers. I want like more fine-grained categories. So you can, as a user, make a choice. Uh, I, I'm okay with those. I'm a bit better with those. So that there's more fine-grained methods. So hopefully, we can get to where it's not blocking like blanket all ads but blocking, blocking the things that, that break the user experience. 
there's some stuff too. Uh, there are ad blockers for all major browsers pretty much too. Um, I would say strongly consider them because even very reputable websites have been co-opted. YouTube was famously co-opted by some crypto mining or crypto jacking scripts that began to uh, really push people's CPUs. And that's probably the last site you would expect. It's a big site. Uh, you know they're going to be scrutinizing the ads that are coming through, but it still happens. Um, there's a famous site as well that had written a, 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 a blistering uh, review about ad blockers, and then eventually, I think that maybe the next day or the next week, they had malware that was pushed through ads on their site. Uh, so be very careful online. It, it's gotten really messy, but yeah, it's 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 a tough path forward, which is why we named the company Brave, because uh, it requires a little bit of courage to, to take this path. Sorry, I was uh, going to just say, I know that in Chrome, at least, on the topic of privacy and ads, we've, we've explored different in interventions in the past, but I thought this would also be a good topic uh, to talk about with respect to things like feature policy, where we're trying to give you better control over third parties and iframes that you're including in your pages. I don't know if you have thoughts on this, Shruby? So, I mean, I think CSP sounds like a little bit closer to what you're saying. Um, I don't have specific thoughts on, like, basically I think what you're saying is how could we, like, potentially enhance CSP in a manner that allows, enables more, um, more control being put in the hands of developers. very last topic in our last nine minutes of this event uh, was actually going to be about the future of the web. Um, uh, folks are curious, like, where is the web going to be in five years from now or ten years from now? And uh, what role is the browser going to play in that overall story? Uh, folks are interested if people in this room had opinions on this, this particular topic. So opening I think two of the most interesting developments that are currently going on in browsers are probably around uh, WebAssembly and around uh, shared exchanges and the web packaging concepts. Uh, WebAssembly, for those unfamiliar, also called WASM, uh, is long term effectively it's going to mean that we can bring nearly any compilable language to the web. Uh, Felix from the Electron team the other day uh, made a lot of headlines because he has an Electron app, which is Chromium under the covers, running Windows 2000, I believe. Was what he was, yeah, he was running Windows 2000 inside of Chrome. It's ridiculous. But you can do these sorts of things today, like bringing all these other languages onto the web. And so I think we're going to see um, a, a large amount of projects come to the web that were previously completely not possible. Um, the folks, the, the ECMAScript committee, Brendan Ike included, has mentioned about how they might extend the JavaScript language inside of WebAssembly specifically rather than extending it in the JavaScript uh, user land. So that stuff like type arrays or other features that are needed for uh, cross-compiled languages could exist. So pointers, all kinds of things that wouldn't make sense in JavaScript might come over into WebAssembly. It's going to be really, really impactful to the broader landscape. And then separately, the web packaging and shared exchange stuff um, that is effectively the ability for uh, people to... Uh, 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 hmm, what am I trying to say? Uh, it's going to allow for people to have sort of like a mesh network or the ability to transport uh, websites from device to device uh, or from a server yeah, acting on a third party, acting on behalf of a third party out to users in a way that's secure and signed and cryptographically proven, uh, which means that a lot of people in areas that are literally not reached by the internet today could still have access uh, to the modern web and updated information. I think uh, Cuba's Packet Network is a really common example of uh, prior art of where a offline mesh network can work really, really well. Um, those are my two things that I think are going to be really fun to watch over five years. So to add to that last bit um, on the packaging, so I think one thing that we've been sort of looking at and kind of exploring is this idea of embedding, just sort of creating these interesting embeddable experiences. Um, so instead of like having to always share URLs, which are like how, how could you, you know, kind of enhance that in ways um, such that, like if you're trying to make like plans for, you know, a move, like you're trying to like book, uh, figure out your hotel room, the, they could just send you like 
a widget for picking out your dates or do your planning as opposed to sort of this back and forth email communication. So finding these new avenues of embeddability. I think to that point, something I've been curious about is in five or 10 years, uh, are we going to see more of the population of people using the web, consuming it via things like an assistant interface where maybe maybe we don't necessarily see people uh, getting the same rendered UI experiences that they do today. Maybe we're you know, better leveraging schema.org style uh, setups where you know I, I expose some API or some service that uh, an assistant search something uh, then consumes and offers up the user like a better embedded version of where they can just consume it a little bit more quickly. Uh, I don't know what that, that means for like web browsers. Uh, do we do we then just become like a, a background service of some sort, a networking stack? I don't know. Um, yeah, poses interesting, interesting questions for the future. I would say if Rob Dodson were in the room, he'd be like, this is why you should care about accessibility because if you have those features and you add a accessible, you know, things to your to your code, then they're going to work better for things like uh, assistant, you know, Google Home devices and all those other things. But I think there's also a risk to a platform that eventually is shaped like that because if the browser eventually this you know API for for like you know other services that are, are rendering things and and less creative experiences are made by the users and displayed in browsers I know me and Addy talked about that a few weeks ago um, that, that seems to be a little riskier at least a little closed down uh, so I think there's still a lot of thought to be uh, put in that area and how, how actually it'll affect the, the ecosystem in the future I, I think the uh, the moral to it though is that just that the web is more and more widely consumed. So the the assistant thing, by the way, I I bought my uh, 91 year old grandfather a Google Home. He uses the web now. It, I don't even know a thousand times more than he ever did before because anything with a UI just confused him. Uh, and this is he talks to it, and this really smart lady talks back to him. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, I'm kind of excited to see how these things start converging together. Uh, one of the one of the first things I, saw, I thought was really exciting was the first time I was prompted to install uh, a and basically install a website as an, an icon on my phone, and it was now I have this app on my phone that's really just a web that I you can't really tell the difference anymore, um, and. Just, just as an example of now, like that's the native experience kind of converging with the web experience, uh, and it's on the other end of the spectrum. You have like the assistant type experience converging with the web experience, and I, I, I think that um, things like WebAssembly and people developing things and in uh, whatever the language they choose and shipping things to their browser is maybe going to result with better interop for other types of services that, you know, if, if I can, uh, if anyone remembers like when Node come, came out and people were like, oh, wait, so I can develop on the server and the browser in JavaScript, you're going to have the same thing the opposite direction where people are like, so wait, I can make servers and browser apps in Rust or C Sharp or whatever I'm doing. Um, I think that it's all just sort of this convergence and it probably won't happen in the next five years, uh, you know, a longer timeline, but um, I see a world where a lot of these things get better uh, interop between them as far as how you disseminate information to people, and I think that'll be a good thing. Um, so uh, I, I think an another thing I'm interested in watching over the next five years is something we were talking about about 15 minutes ago, which is how do we deal with, like, how, how does the web deal with how people make money by producing things for the web and doing that in a way that preserves users' privacy and doesn't track them everywhere and doesn't degrade performance substantially. Um, like, these are big trade-offs, and I think some of these things are not moving in a very sustainable way and are going to have to change. Kenneth or Martin or Jay, did you guys have any thoughts? I, I think it's a bit difficult to say what's going to happen because there's so many different things happening on the web. Um, 
I think like because like I work at Intel and and we're looking we're still like selling like uh, laptops and and desktop. I've also been very interesting to see like now progressive web apps coming to desktop systems, both Windows and Chrome OS. And but we still like see there's some pieces missing. So I thought it's really interesting with WebAssembly. We now saw like Autodesk getting like AutoCAD really working in the browser. But then like but but if everyone who works with like with AutoCAD, like my wife, she's also like creating like huge files and then opening those up in other applications like Revit and emulating like sunlight and whatnot coming in. So like now that people starting to work on like writable files and you can actually work with local uh, files and actually do something like a video editor and all of that, I think that's going to be really exciting uh, as well. But of course, like just like everyone else said, like WebAssembly is super cool. Web packaging is also really cool because that's also going to change like how CDNs work because like suddenly you can do much uh, better caching. Um, so it's it's really interesting. Immersive web is also something that a lot of people care about. I don't personally care so much about that, but it's really interesting to see what's possible, even with things like like video and uh, augmented reality. Uh, any further thoughts before we, we wrap up? Yeah. Did um, I push? I pushed. <laughs> so the, the idea of um, just enabling more use cases on the web that right now, like, I don't know like, about everybody else in the room, but I spend most of my time in the, of the day in the browser using productivity tools. So like the idea of web assembly and better concurrency, enabling more apps and more access to low level things like file APIs and saving back to to your operating system, but also like the idea of web packaging and that unlocking like the problem of what do we do with low and low connectivity phones and low end phones. How do we get uh, these applications to more devices and allow like these micro experiences to 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 share. There's definitely a, a blog post now hack starting like the, the whole approach of the web and how you decentralize the web again from now like the the, f the five big apps that everybody uses to approaches where you can make a little app and share it within your community and allow people access th there. So what's to come? All right. Final final call until we, all right. Okay, uh, with that, uh, thank you to all of our panelists for making it here today, including our remote attendees who've been taking part. We appreciate it. Um, Tracy, you wanna wrap up? Yeah, thank you guys. I know it's late for uh, Martin and Kenneth, so thank you so much for participating and thank you, Jay, for being here. Um, if you all care more about this stuff, every two months we have state of, or sorry, every six months. <laughs> every six months we have state we have state of browsers, um, so you can check that out. And it's basically like the first half of this event where everybody just gives five minute updates on what's going on in the web. Um, so it's a good consolidated view. Uh, we also do state of frameworks as well. And I think there's one coming up in September. So if you care about just getting like five minute updates from all the different frameworks and libraries, uh, that's a really good one as well. So, but besides that, uh, you can follow everybody again on Twitter, uh, on the registration page uh, at this dot, everybody's Twitter handles and most of everybody's GitHub handles are on here as well. So I encourage everyone to just get involved, get started, figure things out. Um, if you're not on Twitter yet, I always tell people if you're a developer and you're not on Twitter, you are kind of missing out on your entire career uh, in a sense. So this is a great way where you can like start the conversations and, uh, you know, share what you're doing and, and really actually like make an impact um, in the web. All right, and with that, Browser Contributor Days comes to a close. Thank you once again to our panelists and to our live streaming crew who've been doing an awesome job during the day. So thank you everybody. With that, we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>